there was no real reason for me to do this. You know, I... There are a hundred other terrible books that I could be reading, slash reviewing, slash making fun of out there. There's... there's a million of them. But this one called to me. You know, from the moment I first heard about Save the Pearls and I read just the summary of the first book, it called to me. Like, it was saying, come here and mock me. Also, by the way, this video was sponsored by Boardwalk. They, um, did not pay me for it, but they did give me the shirt for free. So, if you like this shirt and want to see this or some others like it, then uh, maybe check them out. But yes, the title of this is accurate. Like, ten years after it became irrelevant, I read Save the Pearls. And just like with Way of the Shadow Wolves, I am having my notes on here because there's just too much of them. I would not write those out by hand. I'm just, I'm just not doing it. And <clears throat> some of you saw the title to this video and you thought, oh, oh god, he's doing it. He's doing it. Why is he doing it? And some of you th saw the title and thought, racist Hunger Games? What? what? What is he talking about? And basically those are the people who have heard of Save the Pearls and the people who have not. And the title is not clickbait. This is basically just the Hunger Games if the Hunger Games was extremely racist. So, this book came out in 2012, and the sequel followed in 2013, and that was, you know, when the dystopian young adult boom was at its height. You know, I've talked about uh, some books like that before, like a couple of months ago I did the testing and made fun of that one. And th this falls into that uh, similar category. Like, it's a dystopian novel about a young teenage girl, and there's an authoritarian government, and she tries to change the system, sort of. And, I mean, <clears throat> here's the thing. Most of the genre's entries just put in an authoritarian government and had people overthrow it. And the message was just, authoritarianism is bad. Which is true, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But they weren't talking about any, like, real issues in the real world, the way The Hunger Games was and the way dystopian, the, the dystopias as a genre are usually supposed to do. This book... Save the Pearls does try to tackle an actual societal problem, just does a really bad job of it. In a post-apocalyptic world where resistance to an overheated environment defines class and beauty, Eden Newman's white skin brands her as a member of the lowest class, a weak and ugly pearl. The clock is ticking. If Eden doesn't mate before her 18th birthday, she'll be left outside to die. If only a dark-skinned coal from the ruling class will pick up her mate option, she'll be safe. But no matter how much Eden darkens her skin and hair, she's still a pearl, still ugly, cursed with a tragically low mate rate of 15%. Just maybe one Cole sees the real Eden and will save her. She has begun secretly dating her handsome co-worker, Jamal. But when Eden unwittingly compromises her father's secret biological experiment, she is thrown into the eye of a storm and the remaining patch of rainforest, a strange and dangerous land. Eden must fight to save her father, who may be humanity's last hope while standing up to a powerful beast man she believes is her enemy, despite her overwhelming attraction. To survive, Eden must change, but only if she can redefine her ideas of beauty and of true love. So, in this story, white people are called pearls, and black people are called coals. Oh dear. You know, throughout this whole series, I am not going to be referring to them as pearls and coals. I'm, I'm just going to be calling them black people and white people. I hope you're all okay with that. Like, coal is an actual slur for black people. Like, it's not a very common one, so I don't blame you if you've never heard that before. But it is an actual slur. It is used by racists. And it's even weirder because all of the other races here get to be precious gems. Like, white people are pearls. Latino people are tiger's eyes, and Asian people are ambers. So, why don't black people get to be a precious gem? You know, you could have called them onyx, or jet, or obsidian, and, you know, it would still be a little bit cringy, but at least it wouldn't be an actual goddamn slur, Jesus Christ. Now, if you have heard of this book before, it's probably because there was controversy when it came out, you know? It made a bit of a splash back in 2012, you know, there were blog posts and people on social media were yelling about it, and that sort of thing. And I didn't hear about it until years later, but I thought, well, it can't be that bad, right? 
You know, like, the internet overreacts to this sort of thing, so maybe there's a few problematic aspects to it, or maybe there's some offensive stereotypes, but it can't be that bad. And then I read the summary, and I was like, okay, that doesn't sound good, but I mean, I don't know for sure. No, it really is that bad. The only thing that stops this from being the most racist book I've ever read is that I've also read Mein Kampf. Okay, okay, that's, that's a joke. It's the most racist thing I've ever read that wasn't written by just outright white supremacists. Like, I'm genuinely surprised you can have this much anti-black racism in something without dropping the N-bomb at least once. Now, in addition to using an actual racial slur to describe a group of people, there's a number of other issues we'll be going over here. Like, it still stereotypes black folks in some unpleasant ways, it refers to them as beastly or beast-like a lot, and it doesn't really seem to understand what race is to begin with. Like, we'll, we'll get to that later, don't worry. And I guess this one isn't racist, but it is weird. Uh, it kind of forgets that races other than black people and white people exist. And again, we'll, we'll get into a lot of this as we go on. But the author claimed on her blog after the book came out that Cole was not a slur. And she said, hey, coal is actually useful. You know, you can use it to heat your homes and stuff. Whereas pearls are just pointless and for decoration. Which is really not the comeback that I think she thought it was, because she's basically saying, hey black people, you're useful because we can burn you for energy. And it's even weirder because the absolute lowest of the low in this world's society are uh, albino people, and they're referred to as cottons. Cotton is also useful. You use it to make clothes and stuff. I don't think she thought this through at all. And plus, other races, like I said, are named after gems too, but they're, those are just as useful. Yeah, those are just as useless as pearls, but they're still above white people in this social order. I just, I don't understand. It's like every aspect of this was not thought through. And when the author was promoting it, she even made a trailer, and that trailer features an actress wearing blackface. Do you want to see? I've heard rumors of what happens. They come in the middle of the day when you're sleeping and take you outside. Where you catch the heat. The thing is, there's no proof at all. And that's because you never again hear from those who don't mate by their 18th birthday. Oh my, oh my, anyone you say! <laughs> Too late for that. You're 18 today, aren't you? And you haven't made it for your own good. Why don't you just go to sleep? <laughs> go ahead, drink it. No! Are you sure? Please, just give me another chance! You leave us no choice, then. That is not great. And the production values are just so hilariously low. I'm pretty sure I spent more money on this video than whoever funded that trailer spent on it. Like, and I'm not even paying an actress or anything. That is just sad. Just sad on every level. And <clears throat> I will say, real quick, that most of the racism here is front-loaded. So like the first 70-ish pages of the first book is where most of it's going to be and where I'm going to talk about most of it. Uh, but then there is more stuff sprinkled throughout, don't worry. It, it's not like it ends there. And I will talk about the racism a lot at first, but then I'm going to be moving on to other stuff because there's plenty, plenty of other things to criticize here, believe you me. Like, from the very beginning, it fails just as a book. You know, it's horribly put together and not well written and yada yada, all that stuff you come here to hear me talk about. But later on, it goes so crazy, I almost forgot about all the bigotry. Like, I straight up, like, at the beginning, you can go page by page, literally, and point out all the unpleasantness there, let's say. But by the time I finished the second book and I went back to go over my notes, I almost forgot about a lot of it because it just goes in such a strange direction. Now, if you're not at all interested in hearing about all that racism stuff, then I suppose you could skip ahead, uh, but, you know, you will be missing out on 
stuff from the beginning of the book, so I don't know, I'd still recommend watching it. <clears throat> and obviously, yes, I'm white. That doesn't mean I don't know the smell of bullshit. You know, I can recognize problems here. I can recognize this stuff and point out what's going on here. And other reviewers who are black have talked about this book and have pointed out many of the same issues I'm going to be pointing out. So it's not like I'm getting offended on behalf of someone who is okay with it. They've talked about what they hate here plenty on their own, and I'm just adding my voice to the pile. And <clears throat> I feel the need to bring this up because recently some people have been claiming that acknowledging stereotypes exist, that those stereotypes are untrue, and that you're playing into those stereotypes is the same as agreeing with those stereotypes. You know, they're saying like, ah, you pointed out the racist stereotypes that exist in this thing, that means you believe in those stereotypes, therefore you're the real racist, and no, that's not how that works. That's just a cheap way of trying to deflect blame, and I mean, if you're not deflecting blame and you just genuinely believe that, it's probably because you're a very fucking stupid person. Now, let's also get one thing out of the way. The book's author, Victoria Foyt, I don't think she wrote this to be hateful or derogatory. I think that she genuinely wanted to do something good. I think she genuinely wanted to be uh, anti-racist and she wanted to talk about how discrimination is bad. She just did a really bad job of it. Like, she seems to know that racism is bad, she just doesn't seem to know what it is or how it works. And she wrote a lot defending herself, like on her blog and stuff, and <clears throat> you can check out some of those posts on your own if you're curious, but you know, she claimed that she was colorblind and she understands what it's like to be different and discriminated against because people made fun of her hair when she was younger. Don't think that's the same thing, but okay. And if someone is genuinely this racist in a hateful way, because trust me, it gets bad, it, then they would probably say something like, well, this is just how things work. If you don't like it, then you're just not wanting to admit it. Like, a lot of time racists, especially, especially hardcore ones, are under the impression that everyone secretly agrees with them, but we're just not admitting to it because we don't want to face social backlash for being honest, and... No, that's, that's not true, obviously. Like, most of us just disagree with them and don't like them. And while the books do a really bad job of it, it's, they're definitely trying to send a message of discrimination being bad. You know, like... <clears throat> Victoria Foy was in her 50s when this came out, and remember, it came out 10 years ago, so like, she grew up in a very different world than a lot of us. You know, she doesn't really understand uh, a lot of things that we just kind of take for granted today. You know, sometimes people just say or do things that are offensive or hurtful without meaning to, you know, they're not doing it maliciously. And this goes for like talking about groups of people, you know, races, religions, etc. Uh, but it also goes for like individuals, you know, sometimes you'll say something that accidentally strikes a nerve with somebody and you don't mean to do so, but it still hurts their feelings. Doing this doesn't make you a bad person, because you're just ignorant at that point. What makes you a bad person is not acknowledging that what you did was wrong and refusing to change. I, I don't know, this whole thing just kind of reminds me of that scene from the first Rush Hour movie where Jackie Chan accidentally starts a fight with the bartender. What's up, my nigga? What did you just say? What's up, my nigga? Like, yeah, what he said there was racist, but it's kind of hard to be mad at him. Like, he, he didn't know any better. You know, you just, you tell them what they did was wrong and why it's wrong, and then hopefully they can change. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that's the sort of thing that happened here. You may very well disagree with me, but I don't know. I would encourage you to at least watch this and read the books, and come to your own conclusions. I just don't think that Victoria Foyt is a bad person. I think she's stupid, and I think she has too much of an ego to ask other people for help when trying to understand a new topic that she doesn't know much about, but I don't think she's a bad person. Now, normally I wouldn't do this, but I did make PDFs of both books, and I'm sharing them with all of you. They should be in the pinned comment down below. You should be able to find them. And, I mean, they're not the highest quality PDFs, but, like, you're getting them for free, so don't complain too much. And the thing is, I did that mostly because it's difficult to find these books. Like, not the first one. That one's not too bad. This one I got for like $20 on Amazon, which is a little pricey, but nothing too crazy. The second book, this was a fucking ordeal to get. Like, I, 
The only one I saw available was on American Amazon, and that was for $150, and I was like, I'm not gonna pay that. And then a couple days later, it disappeared, and that's when I actually put out a video a couple months ago asking for help looking for a copy. And then someone pointed me to one on Amazon France, which I bought for around 50 US dollars, and then I waited for it to come here, and I waited almost two months, and it didn't arrive when it was supposed to, so I had to uh, contact the seller, and then they told me, yeah, it's lost in the mail, and then I had to wait for a refund, and then I looked back at American Amazon, and the one that was there before was available again, and it was only about $50, and then I ordered it, and it came in without any further issues. And if you want an idea of how long this whole process took, I wanted this video to be out in March. Now, I've read other reviews of this book, but they're not recent. You know, pretty much all of them are from 10 years ago when it came out, and a lot of them are also on, like, blogs or Tumblr posts or something which are just no longer around. They've been deleted or their websites are no longer hosted. Um, and while some of them are pretty good reviews, they mostly just talk about the racism. You know, they don't really go over all of the other issues here. Like, that's a big part of what makes these books so terrible, but it's only a part. On every level, these fail. Like, the story basically ceases to exist after the opening act, and then it goes off in so many d different directions. Like, I I just ran out of breadcrumbs and couldn't find my way home. Like, th this shit strays so far off the path that by the end it is barely recognizable as racist Hunger Games. Uh, the protagonist, Eden, is somehow simultaneously a complete blank slate, an author self-insert, and an absolutely horrible person. Like, all at once. I don't know how that's possible, but it happens here. Uh, I found a bunch of typos, or but not a bunch of typos, but more typos than are acceptable in a published novel. And any themes that the author tried to send are so twisted that they wind up sending the opposite message in a lot of times. And just don't even get me started on the animal sex. Just don't even. It's, it's an absolute mess. All, overall, it's just a huge mess. But the thing is, other than the racism, the worst part by far is just how boring this is. You know, there's huge segments of this of this series where just nothing happens. And I don't I don't know how long this review is going to be. It might be shorter than I initially thought it was going to, just because there's so much stuff where I just go, yeah, and then nothing happens for a while. I I don't know. We'll have to see. But like conflict, the conflict in the story barely exists. You know, you you have this set up with, I was gonna say a neat world, but it's not a neat world, but it is a world that has plenty of potential for conflicts, and th there's just none. It, it doesn't come up. And then, even within the romance, which takes up a huge chunk of the story, there isn't much conflict there. You know, there's no real will they or won't they. There's no real them trying to get over their own personal flaws in order to be together or anything like that. It's just kind of, they're in love now, and everything's perfect. And, uh, well, that's enough of an intro. This, this has been a long one, but that's enough of an intro. Let's get started on Save the Pearls, Book 1, Revealing Eden. Eden jumped at the sound of approaching steps. They must not see. Hide beauty map. Her mental command caused the life band she wore to send a tiny white spark into the air. In a flash, the holographic images that appeared in front of her, a blonde girl playing on a sunlit beach, disappeared. What's going on? A woman asked. Eden shot to her feet, her heart racing, as a plump, dark-skinned lab assistant appeared on the other side of the partition. It was only Peach, who wasn't as cruel as the rest of them. Oh boy, that's, um... That's not a good start. Um, it, it is a little confusing what Eden is up to at the beginning. Like, she's doing something she's not supposed to be doing, but all we know about her, her surroundings, where she is, is that she's watching kids playing on a beach, and it's apparently some sort of hologram that she's watching. Maybe describe it in a little bit more detail, you know, set the scene, and uh, also the them that she's referring to in italics, because you need to put emphasis on it. Uh, we find out pretty quickly that that's black people, so... Yeah, just not a, not a good start. Eden's blank emotional mask slammed into place. Never let them see how you feel. Um, she said, what do you mean? Didn't you monitor the test subject's medications? Peach said. Yes, of course. Eden couldn't afford to make a mistake. Then why isn't the report on schedule? 
Had Peach forgotten that Eden's skin only had a dark coating? Maybe she was passing after all. Wouldn't that be nice? Eden almost enjoyed pointing out the truth. Okay, so it turns out that Eden was basically just watching TV while she's at work. Like, she works as a lab assistant, and she's supposed to be doing something else, but she's just essentially watching TV. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the fact that she's wearing blackface. In this world, they call it a coating. And in fact, on the cover of this book, you can see half of Eden's face is white, and the other half is her wearing her blackface coating. And it's supposed to protect lighter-skinned people from radiation. Because in this world, basically at some point, solar radiation got really bad and out of hand, and it got bad enough that people get skin cancer super easy, and now they all live underground. And the thing is, because black people are just more resistant to that, there are more of them, and then they became in charge of society. And the thing is, if radiation was really that bad, then a little melanin in your skin wouldn't make, th make that much difference. Now, I'm willing to overlook some scientific inaccuracies, so that alone is not a huge problem, but it is worth pointing out. But again, like white people wear coating over their skin to help protect them from all this radiation. And so for a huge chunk of this book, the main character, Eden, is walking around with a dark paste on her skin to make her look like she's black. And honestly, it just made me picture Caitlin Olsen in Lethal Weapon 6 the entire time I was reading. My love, when I look deep in your eyes, I find my own destiny. Now, I get that Victoria Foyt was trying to put blackface into a different context and try and, like, change the way it works in this world as compared to our world, but there, there's just too much historical baggage associated with it. You know, you are you're much better off just avoiding that issue entirely. And they even mention later that there are performers that do minstrel shows in whiteface, so Foyt knows that impersonating other races is often used in a derogatory manner, but she still did it here. And, uh, like, we're literally on the first page. Plus, it's just dumb for other reasons. Number one, they live underground, so there really shouldn't be this much solar radiation all over the place so they shouldn't need to have to wear coatings on their skin. It shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, number two, wearing the coating is mandatory, and being in public without it is illegal for white people. <clears throat> and it's even mentioned that Eden has barely ever seen her parents without it. And that makes me think, why? Why would that be illegal? Like, this is supposed to be a reversal of real-world race relations. There was no point that I'm aware of, where black people were forced to hide the fact that they were black and, like, put flour on their skin or something. And, uh, number three, Eden also has to coat her hair, because her hair is naturally blonde and it... she makes it black, which... Uh, how, how does that help anything? Is it supposed to be a reference to how black people and white people's hair grows in different? I... I... I genuinely don't know. So basically, this opening scene, uh, like I said, Eden is working as an assistant in a laboratory, and she needs to pass on some reports, but she can't do it because her supervisor, Ashina, has not come in to approve the reports yet because she's off slacking somewhere. And then Peaches, the woman who came up to her, is understanding about it and then just leaves her alone. So Eden just watches some ducks fly on a hologram, which... Like, I guess they're underground, so they just have holograms of, like, trees and shit around to make people feel less depressed, which is fine, I guess. But while she's watching the ducks fly around, she uses their scientific name, which is Anas Platyrinchos. And she actually does that a lot, like, with various animals and plants. Like, she'll see them and think of their regular name and then think of their scientific name in her head. And I think it's done as a way to make Eden seem smarter and make the book seem more scientific, but... It, uh, it fails at that. Like, it's, it's just pretentious and awkward, you know? No, no one talks like this. No one even thinks like this. I don't even think actual scientists will do that. But then this happens. Eden slumped back in her chair with a heavy sigh. I'm a stone in a cool, dark cave. The small holographic image appeared in front of her while she repeated this soothing thought over and over. Soon, the constant jumbled noise of the world band that streamed into her head grew distant. In that quiet, treasured space, she allowed her one small but true thought. I hate them. Wow. Uh, she just... 
She, she just came out and said it. Literally on the second page of the book, the main character came right out and said that she hates black people. Y you know, I was, I was expecting that I would have to, like, examine her actions over the course of the series and point out how she's a terrible person based on that, but she, she just came out and said it. Page two! And the thing is, this never comes back up. Like, not once in the entire series does it come back up that she apparently just really hates black people. Like, if this was acknowledged early on as a flaw in the character and something that's wrong with her, and then over the course of the story Eden worked past it, then I guess it could have been fine. You know, she could have decided by the end, like, you know what, I don't hate black people. I hate people that treat me as lesser, and I hate the system that is keeping me down. But race is not something that you can judge people off of. Like, it, it, I just, instead she just starts dating black dudes after a while, and we pretend that she never said that. And honestly, dating black people when you just outright hate black people is weird. I want to unpack that, but I am nowhere near qualified, so I'm going to let someone else deal with it. But, like, just from that moment, just, do I even need to go over the rest of this fucking book? <laughs> All of the problems with it are in the first two pages, I think. I mean, I'm going to keep going, obviously, but just, I... Okay, okay. So Eden thinks back to her mom for a minute because we need some exposition, and her mom died of the heat, which is just skin cancer, and Eden mentions that she has never even been outside. Like, she's been underground her whole life. I don't know how solar radiation would get underground. Like, I think rocks and dirt block that pretty good. But again, and, you know, she also, during her long exposition thoughts, uh, she just straight up says that Pearls is a racist term for whites, which is weird because pearls is used almost exclusively to describe white people. So I'm not sure, like, what? Wouldn't they have, like, a different name for themselves or something? I just, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. So because everyone's underground and they don't get to see nature or anything, uh, most people use these things called life bands <clears throat> to see holograms and explore hologram worlds which is, okay, fine, that makes sense. And Eden's life band was given to her by the government, and she thinks, like, well, at least the government cares about me. Which is weird, because a huge part of this early book is about how they're about to cut her off from her food supply. Like, she needs to mate before she turns 18, or by the time she turns 18, otherwise she's gonna die. So you'd think she would hate them. You know, you'd think she would hate the government as, like, the, represent the representation or the epitome, or whatever you want to call it, of just this world's racism and the way that she's being kept down. Like, you'd think she would hate them, but I guess not. A familiar rush of pleasure, mixed with fear, coursed through her at the sight of the white girl. Images of pearls in natural coloring were forbidden. If they caught Eden looking, she would be punished. And yet she couldn't resist watching the pale, slim girl bounce a multicolored ball over to a young man who was also white-skinned. She wore a polka-dot bikini, all that skin exposed! Nearby, other whites lounged on thick towels or cabana chairs, or played cards at tables out in broad daylight. Sunshine glittered on a blue ocean that stretched across the semicircular cove like a big happy smile. Children, lots of them, even siblings, chased after the rushing ocean waves back and forth. Their shrill screams floated on the air, but these were screams of joy, not terror. So, she watches kids frolicking out in the sun on the beach as a fantasy, but it's illegal to see white people on video for reasons, which is, again, weird. I don't think there was ever a time period where it was illegal to show black people on TV. And the thing is, I know I said that Foyt wrote this out of ignorance. You know, I, I don't think she meant to be this hateful, and I, I stand by that. But moments like this nearly changed my mind, because Holy fucking shit, does that have some serious 14 words energy? Like, I, I could see this idea working as, like, she yearns for freedom and she yearns to be outside, outside of this, if it was not really specified that it's white people playing. Like, if it was just people of all races playing together on a beach and 
she's like looking at nature and trees and jungles and stuff, and she's thinking, wow, I wish I could be out there, then I think this would be fine. But like the fact that it's it's portraying this as like, oh, white people are so horribly oppressed, and like I I guess that's kind of the point, but like Jesus fucking Christ, I just no, we're no. Uh so Eden complains a little bit about how being blonde and having blue eyes is no longer considered pretty. And that is one part of this book that I think works okay, uh, because it is accurate that beauty standards change over time. Like, that, that's one thing this book gets right. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can watch movies from the early 2000s where women insult each other by saying, your butt is big, whereas nowadays that's considered very attractive. And, you know, paleness used to be sexy, which is why in paintings of Queen Elizabeth she looks like a fucking ghost. Uh, nowadays, being tan is considered attractive, which is why the Kardashians have been trying so hard to make themselves look Latina. But Eden just spends a lot of time whining about it, and a lot of time wishing she was darker. And the thing is, couldn't you, like, go to a tanning bed or something? Wouldn't they have that in this world? Like, m maybe it'd be stupid, because it'd give you cancer, but I mean, it gives you cancer in real life, and people do it, and like, you, you could do that, get a few shades darker. I don't know. But the thing is, there are worse aspects to the racism here that she experiences. Maybe you should focus on those. You know, focus on, like, various types of discrimination she has, like she can't get certain jobs, and people look at her suspiciously on the street, and the government has specific laws in place trying to prevent her from doing things like, things like that, you know? Just imagine a reversal of this, you know? Imagine a book about a black girl who's just desperate to get a white boyfriend and wishing that she was blonde and, you know, having difficulties with that. And you can kind of sympathize with that. But in the background, all of her friends are slaves. Like, it would be stupid because you're like, okay, there's... Yes, you're having some problems with racism, but other people are having much worse ones. And so Eden and her dad are working at this lab because her dad is a genius, and they're working on some sort of super secret experiment. We, we don't know exactly what it is or what it's about yet, but we just know it's top secret and it's super important. At last, Eden heard Ashina's brisk footsteps on the concrete floor and stole a glance at her nemesis, envious of the beauty's easy confidence. Voluptuous, with raisin-colored skin, everything about Ashina screamed ruling class. Alright, first of all, it's super cringy to describe people's skin color by comparing it to food. You know, I don't know why that became such a common thing, but it's a very common thing. We should stop doing it. It's just weird and cringy. Like, they, they don't do it with white people. You know, they, or at least they usually don't do it with white people, so they just maybe just stop. And secondly, every black person we meet in this story is super, super dark-skinned, which is not how it is in real life. Like, I actually had a bunch of jokes uh, for this moment, but I feel like I'm treading dangerous ground already, so I'm not going to make any of them. But basically, it would be kind of neat if we saw some black people who were lighter skinned than others, and there was still some discrimination based on that. Like, well, we're both black, but I'm darker than you, so I'm better. Like, there's, there's discrimination within races, because that's a real thing that does happen. And we could realize that these sorts of relations are complex affairs. You know, you could write something about that. It would be kind of interesting. You could have, you know, something to say, maybe. But it's not there. And Ashina... We're, we're told that Ashina must have a super high mate rate, while Eden's is only about 15%. And that is not explained in a lot of detail, but basically what it is, there's some sort of planet-wide network where it just tells you, am I hot or not? And everyone is entered into it. And when you turn 18, you have to get mated, uh, which is, they, they don't really have marriage in this world, we'll get to that later, but like you have to be making children by that point. But of, at the same time, everyone is only allowed one child. It's, it's kind of weird. And if you don't, uh, if you're not mated by that age, then you get cut off from your food supply and left outside to die. And Eden is six months away from turning 18, so she, like the clock's running out and she's getting nervous. Or maybe they're just cut off from their food supply that's provided by the government and they just get to live underground on their own after that. Because later we see people who have aged out and have been cut off, but they're still walking around underground and 
living their lives, you know? Something an editor might have caught. Plus, we know that there is money in this world. Like, there's jobs and people get paid for it and they mention it more than once. Like, couldn't you just buy your own food? Like, maybe it would be expensive to live that way, but, you know, people seem to have found a way to survive. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Just, this plot, this plot maybe could have worked if you didn't have the racial aspect to it. Like, it, it makes the government seem oppressive if people are forced to have children, uh, even if they don't really want them, by a certain age, otherwise they're killed. Like, it makes this government and this world seem awful and dystopian and oppressive. But the thing is, even though this uh, world is supposed to be super stratified based on race and it's supposed to suck to be white, everyone is targeted by this policy. Like, everyone needs to do it. It's not just towards white people, so is is this government really racist or not? Like, I, I, I don't know. It's also kind of dumb that 18 is the cutoff because, you know, you'd think it would be like 25 or something so you're not just cutting them off before most of their reproductive years, like before they even have a chance to really do it or try or anything. And honestly, there's just a shitload of exposition in this first chapter. Like, you know, they'll have like two paragraphs of the actual story moving forward and then a page of exposition and then two more paragraphs and then a page of exposition and my God, it is just obnoxious. So Ashina asks Eden to send in the report before she goes on break, and Eden says she already sent in the report, and Ashina acts very rational when confronted with this information. Ashina jumped up and grabbed Eden's lab coat. Are you calling me a liar? Eden flinched. One of them was touching her. White hot light exploded in her, in her head. Before she knew it, she blurted out an incendiary racial slur. Get your hands off me, you damn coal! Victoria, you said this wasn't a slur. Like, you defended yourself by claiming that Cole was not a slur. And then, right there, it just said that it's a fucking slur. I d Is it a slur because there's a swear word in front? Like, if you call someone a Jew, that's fine. But if you call them a fucking Jew, that's not fine. Like, I is that what's happening here? I don't know, man. I'm, I'm shooting in the dark and my gun is full of blanks. We are on page 10. So when this happens, everyone else in the lab, which is mostly black people, uh, forms a mob and then immediately attacks Eden, and Eden straight up says, oh my god, they're about to kill me. And we're just moving past that because we don't have time. Uh, so her father, who remembers the head scientist here, despite being white, uh, sees this and he calls out to her, and he calls her Dot, which is short for daughter. And it's really stupid, and it's desperate to sound different, and it just comes up a lot, like, I, I don't know anyone who just refers to their kids as son and daughter, like, to their face. So having a shortened form of that as a nickname is weird. Like, maybe you could come up with some sort of backstory reason for why that's the case, but we don't get one here. So Eden runs from the mob for about a paragraph before she runs into the boss of the whole lab, who is a fellow named Ronson Bramford. It's a weird name. Is it just me or is that a weird name? It seems like a weird name. And then he tells them, hey, go back to work, and they just instantly disperse. Like, you know, this angry lynch mob just instantly disperses with a couple of words. Because that's how things work. That's how people work, you know? That, that's such a thrilling action scene. You know, I had so much time to, to get into it. So Ronson is tall, handsome, super dark-skinned, and he's somehow super wealthy and has a lot of political influence and is in charge of this lab and has a long tragic backstory despite being 22 years old like the thing is when i read this i straight up forgot he was 22 years old in my mind he was like 35 because he just has so much life that he's already lived but then i was putting my notes together and it mentioned he was 22 years old and i was like oh oh okay like th this dude has an ex-wife and a child and he's only that age. It's just, it's just a weird thing to me. Like, I, I guess, spoiler alert, I hope you don't mind, uh, Bramford and Eden start dating at one point, and I suppose it is better for a 17-year-old girl to date a 22-year-old man than to date a 35-year-old man, but still, it, it is just a very strange thing. Like, it, I know I'm focusing on this a bit more than I probably should, but it just gets in my mind every time I think of Bramford, they're like, he's 22, 
So Bramford tells off Ashina and tells her to get back to work, and then he spends some time talking to Eden and her dad. And uh, we also note at this time that his bodyguard is named Shen, and Shen is half black and half Asian. And at this point we learn that Asian people are called Ambers, and the Latino people are called Tiger's Eyes, like I said earlier. And according to this book series, those are the only four races that exist. White people, black people, Asians, and Latinos. Now it's time for a very long tangent. Like, this is a very horribly stupid way of organizing things. And if you don't believe me, let me just ask you, where would Indian people fit in this system? Like, people from India. Where would Middle Eastern people fit? Where would Native Americans fit? I, I don't know where they'd be. And, like, one group of people who are not mentioned in this book series at all, one ethnic group that has probably gotten more shit than anyone else in history, are Jews. And they're, they're not in here. Like, how would they fit in? Like, sure, you could say maybe the Jews were, like, rolled into one of the other races, like white people or something, but do you think that people are just gonna let go of centuries of anti-Semitism immediately? Like, no, like, especially if you're suddenly near the bottom of the social totem pole, totem pole you're gonna look for someone to look down on and be like, well, I'm white, but at least I'm not Jewish. Like, that, that, that would be a thing. That's what people do, because they're cunts. But just, this is never even mentioned. And the thing is, those are the four big races in the United States, but there are others. You know, there's smaller groups, like I said, American Indians, uh, Middle Eastern people, that sort of thing. This is a very America-centric view of things, which could maybe work. Like, I could see a world where this idea works. Like, if it went out, uh, if they went out into, like, other countries and stuff, and they saw that the way it works where they live is different than in other places, then it could point out, like, hey, this is actually not very smart. It's not a good way of organizing things. But the book treats it as this, as if it's universal. The thing is, the definition of race changes depending on time period and location. So, People getting split into easily recognized categories might make sense to you, but if you go to a different place, then they just have a different way of organizing things. Like, for example, uh, here they describe people as Asian, and by that they mean East Asian, because in the United States, usually when we say Asian, we mean East Asian people, so like people from Korea, Japan, China. Uh, whereas in the United Kingdom, when they say Asian, they usually mean South Asian, so like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, because they just have a bigger South Asian community than we do, but... And anyways, the point is, all East Asian people tend to get lumped together by Americans. Like Japanese, Chinese, Korean, all them. But if you actually go over to those countries, and you ask them if they're all the same race, they're gonna say no. Like, there is a hell of a lot of racism against, uh, from like, Japanese people to Korean people, and Korean people to Vietnamese people, and so on and so forth. Like, it's pretty bad, even though we all tend to lump them together. Uh, then there's other examples of this too, like the Yugoslav Wars were basically just a bunch of groups of white people killing other white people for being the wrong kind of white. Or the Rwandan Genocide was one gr group of black people killing a different group of black people for being the wrong kind of black. Like, and even people that are lumped in as white can look quite a bit different from one another. Like, you know, Irish people are much, much paler than Italian people, usually. And, like I said earlier, Africans vary quite a bit in terms of skin tone. Like, depending on what part of Africa you're from, or your ancestors are from, you could be super, super dark or much lighter. Like, it, there's a lot of variation there. And Latino people just... Latino just doesn't make sense as a racial category, even if we treat it as one. Like, the term literally just means anyone from Latin America. So Mexico all the way down to Argentina. But the thing is, people over the past couple hundred years have come in there from all over the world. Like, there's people there that are whiter than me. And not one or two of them. Millions! You know, you go to Brazil, Mexico, Uruguay, wherever, there's white people there, and there's other races too. Like, there's indigenous Americans, Asian people, etc. Like, there, there's a lot of them, and they're all Latino. Like, stereotypically, the stereotypical Latino is a mestizo person, which is someone with a combination of European and indigenous ancestry, but that, that's not all of them. You know, like, this person is a Latino, but so is this one, and this one, and this one. Like, this caste system that they set up in this book implies 
that racial differences are very easy to define and that they're immutable facts of nature when they just, they just aren't. Like, there are differences between groups of people. You know, things like skin tone, height, propensity towards certain genetic diseases, you know, that sort of thing. Like, there are differences, but the way we categorize those differences is based on societal expectations. It's arbitrary. Now, a smart author who understood that would probably have pointed that out, and they could maybe do something with it, like uh, have Indian people, like India Indian people, uh, get lumped in with Latinos because they have a similar skin tone, and then people say that that's kind of dumb. Like, they say, what? We're, no, we're different from each other, why are we getting lumped in together? Or have white people with Spanish last names that are classified as white, and they try to argue, no, no, I'm, I should be classified as Latino. Like, you know, that sort of thing. Like, you could do something with that, but th this author doesn't because she doesn't understand what she's talking about. And here is the thing. Here is the thing that makes this book series fall apart like on just a basic foundational level. Like it just completely fails to send the message it's sending. In this world, some races survive radiation better than others. And that implies that some races actually are better than others. Whoops! That defeats the entire fucking purpose. And then there's the whole mixed race thing. Like, it's mentioned that Shen is half Asian, and East Asian by that, uh, and it's no big deal other than he's apparently not supposed to be security because only full-blooded black people are supposed to be security, but Bramford just got him the job, and I, that's uh, okay. That, the thing is, mixed race people are implied to be very common here. We only ever really see Shen, but it's implied to be pretty common because, like, you know, Eden has a black boyfriend we'll see pretty quick, and other white people try to date black people a lot. Like, it's, it's not an unusual occurrence here. And interracial marriage is not illegal or anything, so there's nothing discouraging people from doing it. So there should be more of it, and it should be an important part of their legal system and their society because like I said, race defines everything in this setting, apparently. Like, in societies where race is super important, being mixed race is sometimes a very important category, and it comes with its own unique challenges. Like, like I mentioned, mestizo was a category created by the Spanish colonial system, and they were a distinct legal category. Like, they had their own rights and their own uh, privileges and their own restrictions on what they could and couldn't do. Like, it was its own category that came with its own set of issues. And in some places, they've just outright measured it before. Like in French Caribbean colonies, like Haiti, they had specific legal definitions for everything from being half white and half black all the way down to 1 128th black. And like the, these all had their own names and their own uh, legal rights again and things they could and couldn't do. Like this could get complicated because imagine if someone who was like 1 8th black had a child with someone who was half black. Like, you know, the math starts getting kind of weird after a certain point. And in the United States, where mixed race uh, people were less common back in the day, uh, you would be considered a colored person in some states if you were one eighth or one sixteenth non white, which is kind of stupid. Like, it, to give you an idea of just how little one eighth is, I would be considered Japanese under that system. Like, it just. It's just a dumb way of doing things. And the fact that this never comes up is just one more way in which Foyt just doesn't understand how any of this works. Uh, so back to the actual story. Uh, Bramford calls in another security guard to talk to him for a minute, and this guy's named Jamal. And Eden thinks about how he is secretly her boyfriend. And she, in her mind, she calls him My Dark Prince. Uh, uh... There's some more exposition. We learned that Bramford's father died in a, an attack by a Pearl terrorist. It's all the information we're given, uh, but I guess it's a thing that happened. And we also learn about an organization of black people who, who vow to rid the world of white people. And they apparently might be spying on this lab and trying to get information from them. Uh, for some nefarious purpose, and so that's why Bramford is talking to Jamal. He's like, hey, make sure everything is sealed up, and, you know, that sort of thing. And this group calls themselves the Federation of Free People. Are you f fucking kidding me? If you're unaware, in the United States in the 19th century, 
there were organizations of black men who left slavery, and they called themselves Freedmen's Association. Maybe, maybe choose a name that doesn't sound like that. I mean, you could have you gone with pretty much anything. Like, you could have gone with the Dark Power Movement. Like, that's stupid, but it's better. Or like the African People's Union or something. Like, th those would be kind of stupid and cringy, but it'd be better than this. And what is the FFP's relationship with the government here? Like, they're introduced as if they're some kind of violent radicals which have to hide their very existence, but later we see them just walking around in public wearing their uniforms with no trouble. If they're terrorists, isn't that kind of like wearing a shirt that says, Hello, I'm a member of Al-Qaeda? That, that's very strange. And they also have their own hideouts and their own weapons and bombs and, you know, just stuff you would expect terrorists to have. <laughs> and it's mentioned later by members of the FFP that they want to overthrow the government, so wouldn't the government know this and crack down on them? And for that matter, are they really a small minority of violent extremists, or do most of the people in this society agree with them? Because this society is extremely racist, so would they all agree with them? I don't know. That's part of the problem here. We don't know exactly how extreme they are considered by the standards of this world. So we get like no dimension and no feeling for them or for what this world is like or for why we should apparently be afraid of them. So Bramford realizes that if Eden keeps working, then there might be more trouble, so he just sends her home so everyone has time to cool down. Sure, that makes sense. And while she's walking home, Eden notices that her oxy levels are low. And here is one of the strangest parts of this whole book. And, well, who am I kidding? It barely breaks the top 10, but it is we very weird. Everyone in this world is constantly on oxycodone. And I don't mean the people in this world use oxycodone a lot. I mean, literally everyone is literally always high on oxycodone. We're on page 19! Victoria, you cannot keep giving me all this shit to cover. We have so much more to go over. You cannot keep doing this to me. Her world band voice gently warned her. My dear, your oxy levels are in the red zone. The UniGov called oxy the happy drug, which seemed absurd since everyone knew happiness had gone the same way as the dolphins. The full dose Eden had taken at 18 should have kept her on an even keel throughout her 12-hour work shift, but the extra stress had pushed her over the edge. Already she felt the telltale dryness in her mouth, the jittery shakes, and terrible cravings. Earlier it was called a life band, now it's called a world band. I don't know why. Like, if everyone is always on oxy, how does anything get done? Like, it, oxycodone is an opioid painkiller. It's related to things like morphine and heroin and fentanyl. Like, it slows down your mind and your metabolic processes, and when you take a lot of it, it, like, slows you down, chills you out, basically. That, that's what opioids do, they're depressants. And they also make you extremely constipated when you take too much of them, which might go some way to explaining why everyone in this world is such a cunt, but, you know, the thing is, how would you get anything done if you're if everyone is constantly high, I don't understand. Like, if everyone took some when they, like, got home after work and, you know, so they were all still addicts, then sure, I could kind of buy that, but the fact that they're always on it, even at work, is just stupid. It's just stupid. I don't understand. What does Victoria Foyt think oxycodone is? And another thing about this is, how do they grow enough poppies to make all this oxycodone? Like, I assume they do all their farming underground with, like, ultraviolet lamps or something. Like, I, I could see how that would work out. But think about how much food they could grow instead if they were not growing all these fucking poppies to make oxycodone. Because you would need a lot if everyone is constantly using it. Like, there wouldn't even be a food shortage if that was the case. I don't understand any of this. So Eden goes home. And despite the apparent lack of all these resources, which has forced people to only have one child and yada yada, uh, she has a pet dog, who's named Austin, and her own apartment. Because, you know, she's so horribly abused and oppressed. Wish I could have my own fucking apartment. So, an officer visits her, and not physically, but like, she projects a hologram to her and they start talking for a bit. And she says that Eden has six months to find herself a mate before she gets cut off from her food supply and her supply of oxy, and possibly thrown outside. It is... I don't know. It goes back and forth. It's not explained at all. Like, 
Maybe she gets thrown outside, maybe she just got off from food. But the thing is, we already knew all of this. Like, just cut out that early exposition, and we could have Eden be worried, but not know what she's worried about, and then leave this scene here. Like, it would make things go faster, especially at the beginning, when it just keeps interrupting us to talk about this other stuff, and it would feel more natural. Like, Eden wouldn't need to think about, oh, okay, I'm, I, I only got six months, I gotta get a dick in me before then, or I'm dead, but then we also get it said again here. Like, it, it's just weird. I don't like it. And Eden says that she would rather be dead than mate with a white person because she doesn't want her children to grow up with the same problems she's had. Uh, but she also feels that there's no one out there who would ever want such a horrible, ugly, white girl. Life is so hard. Look, her mate rate is 15%, okay? And I don't know exactly what that means. Does that mean 15% of people want to date her, or there's a 15% chance of her finding someone? I, I, I'm not totally sure. But 15% is not 0%. Like, there's, there's someone out there for you. Like, even if you're not considered conventionally attractive by your society, because again, remember, beauty standards do change based on time period and location, there's someone out there who has a different type and would be into you. You know, whether you're skinny or fat or pale or darker skinned or blonde or redhead or whatever. Like, there, there's people out there who would be into you. Like, people who are often considered ugly still have relationships and get married and have children. Like, that happens. And then we got more fucking weird stuff about this world to cover. So, Eden's family, at some point, adopted Emily Dickinson as an ancestor. And Emily Dickinson was a real person. She was a poet. Why? Why would you adopt someone as an ancestor? Uh, like, throughout the story, Eden thinks of a bunch of poems by Emily Dickinson and uses them as, like, life advice or how to keep her resolve in tough times and stuff like that. But she could just be a fan of her work. You know, she could just say at some point, I really like Emily Dickinson because X, and then you could still do the same thing. Like, adopting ancestors is just an odd thing to include. Like, if it's apparently common in this world, then we should see other people do it. But we don't. We only ever hear Eden and her family doing it. Like, if other people did it, it might still be odd, but it would at least, would at least add some dimension to this world. Because, like, you know, everyone only has one child, so families are just much smaller than they used to be, and people want to think back and be like, oh yes, I'm related to a great scientist or a great conqueror or something like that. Like, okay, that could maybe add some dimension to it. And, hell, maybe it could even help make your point about racism, which, remember, that's what this book is about. Like, if, for example, if some people, some black people, like in the FFP or something, adopted civil rights leader like Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, and they used them and their words to attack other races. Like, you know, they used Nelson Mandela's words of, like, freedom and equality and decided to start talking about how he actually meant you should hate white people. You know, like, perverting their words, basically. And rather than ending the discrimination, they're just reversing it. And that would maybe help show something. Like, it would be a tricky minefield to navigate, certainly. Like, you would be possibly uh, saying or doing some extremely racist stuff, but, I mean, this book's already doing that. But, you know, it could maybe be done. It's just, I don't know, I see so many points in this book where I'm like, okay, you could maybe have done something with that, and then it just shits the bed completely. So then Eden's secret boyfriend, Jamal, calls her and visits her over the hologram network thingy. How's my little bunny, he said. Jamal, she said, her sensors registering the warmth of his arms as they snaked around her. Austin shot up, growling. She had forgotten about him. It was embarrassing, really. As if she'd trained her dog to hate coals. Maybe he wasn't colorblind after all. <coughs> this is insane. E even the dog is racist in this world. This is absolutely fucking nuts. How does that, e how does that even happen? They're colorblind. I don't understand. So, Jamal and Eden talk for a bit, and he invites her to a moon dance, which is apparently just a thing where people go outside at nighttime, so the radiation isn't too bad, and they just party. And attendance is mandatory which is a little strange, but I mean, I guess it's like the government trying to keep people entertained so they don't overthrow them, like bread and circuses, but 
they don't focus on it much. And Eden is happy because, like, now he's going to be publicly acknowledging their relationship. And, again, Eden has gone to these moon dances before because they're mandatory, but earlier she said she'd never been outside. Just plot hole after plot hole, man. Like, you need an editor, Victoria. Even if you were a good writer, which you're not, you would need an editor. So, Eden heads out into the tunnels and walks to the train station. And as she's walking through the tunnels, she thinks about how she's afraid that every black person she passes is going to hurt her. And I'm not even going to touch that one. We're just, we're just moving right on past it because I just, no, we're not doing it. Uh, what I will complain about is how there's no description of the tunnels whatsoever. Like, how big are they? Are the floors made of rock or are they made of metal? Like, how crowded are they? Are there just a couple of people walking around or are you pressed in with a big mass of bodies? Or what sort of things do you see when you're walking around? Like, do you see shops? Do you see graffiti on the walls? Do you see government propaganda being broadcast? Are there kids running around playing? Like, these are the sorts of things you use to set the scene. You know, if it's a area where it's like super nice and brightly lit and there's a couple of plants hanging around, then that means it's probably a, a rich area or like a government area or something like that. But if it's run down and a bunch of the lights are broken so it's hard to see and there's rust everywhere, then that probably means the poorer area. Like, if we saw that when Eden was walking through here, then that could tell us like, okay, she lives in a really shitty area and she wants to escape, which could give some explanation as to why she's so desperate for a black boyfriend. Or maybe it could just be like, okay, this world is dying and the government is barely holding it together. Like, there's a lot you could do, but we just get nothing. It's just, she walked through the tunnels, there were some other people there. Like, that's all we get. So while Eden is on the train, she just randomly thinks back to her father's super secret experiment. Apparently he is working on combining human and animal DNA in order to make us immune to radiation or at least more resistant to radiation. Now, again, that's stupid, but like, okay, I can work with some scientific inaccuracies in your science fiction dystopia story. Well, I'm not even sure this story could really be considered science fiction, but we'll get to that later. Like, it just, I, I can work with some of that, but why reveal it now is the main thing. Like, later we see the experiment in action. Like, we see it happen a, a little while after this. And it would be more dramatic and surprising if we didn't know what it was. And, hell, maybe even Eden could just not know what it is, and she'd be surprised. She'd be like, oh, that's what I was working on this whole time? But, like, no, they just come right out and tell us. So we don't have a chance to wonder and ponder. And, you know, you want to tease your audience. You want to give them little hints so they start thinking about it themselves. So, while she's on the train, she meets two FFP soldiers, just wearing their uniforms. Again, like, they're supposed to be terrorists, but they're just announcing, Hello, I am a terrorist, on the train. And one of them is described as a blue-black giant. And the two soldiers come up to her and grab her. And they act really creepy while they're doing so. And Eden thinks back to a nursery rhyme that she heard when she was a child. Little pearly whirly, lost inside the mines. Tossed from coal to coal, in fear she whines. I'm sorry, mother. He said he only wanted to see my white skin shine. So in this world, there is a children's nursery rhyme about a white girl getting kidnapped and gang raped by a bunch of black guys. What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, what the fuck? So the two black guys, who never actually get names, like, never ever, they, they never, okay, I guess we don't need to know that, uh, drag her off to the moon dance at knife point, and Eden tries to call out for Jamal, but he's not there, even though he's supposed to be there, and they, she just doesn't know where he went, and she can't find him anywhere. And they start dancing in the middle of the crowd, you know, everyone is going crazy, and no one seems to question that she's at knife point, like, may maybe you could have thrown in a line about how people don't notice that sort of thing in crowds, or maybe they're all on hallucinogens or something, so they're not going to notice, but okay, whatever. And they start dancing with the crowd, the two guys are, essentially, they're sexually assaulting Eden, you know, they're touching her all over her body, kissing her without permission, that sort of thing. And this might have been a tense scene, where I'm 
thinking, oh god, I hope she gets out, I hope she's okay. If I didn't just hate Eden, you know, that's the problem. I, I just I just hate her too much. Like, it's, it's not going to work as a tense scene. And Jamal never shows up. Uh, she keeps hoping that he'll rescue her, but he doesn't. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, and then Bramford arrives, and he shoots at the two men, and then they just run off. And Eden takes this time to get very annoyed with Bramford, and thinking about how he saved her life because he thinks that he owns her. Very grateful, Eden. So Bramford takes her to his private hovercraft, which is piloted by the only Latino person in this entire series, and they don't get a name, so... You know, I, I guess that's worth mentioning. And... Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, the only Asian person is Shen, and he's half Asian. And I guess they would mention his mother briefly, but she's never actually in the story. So this story has one Latino person, one half Asian person, and everyone else is either black or white, or Indian, but they don't really come up until later. And so we just kind of miss out on the way that race relations aren't just two ways. Like, there's multiple different groups of people out there, even in this world that you created. While she's on the hovercraft, Eden watches a video of an albino being killed by an angry mob that serves no purpose other than saying that people hate albinos, but we, are, we already know that, so it's not really a big deal. I'm also not sure why she would be watching it at this time period. And uh, we find out that a fire broke out at their laboratory, so they fly back. And Bramford prepares to undergo the procedure to become part animal, Apparently it's risky because they haven't tested it before, but he wants to do it. And then when they're at the lab, uh, and they're, all, they're talking about this, Eden gets a call from Jamal, and then she sneaks away to find him. So, in other words, this guy who abandoned her and let her get kidnapped and sexually assaulted by two strangers is apparently better and more trustworthy than the guy who saved her life. This bitch has two functioning brain cells, and they are both fighting for third place. So she finds Jamal, and he's wearing an FFP uniform, and he's with a bunch of other FFP soldiers, and some of the other security guards from the lab are also apparently FFP soldiers. And then the two guys from earlier arrive. And Jamal gives a short, evil speech, which... I, I don't care enough to read it. Uh, I'm sure you're all very upset with me for skipping over it. It's not interesting, trust me. And in his evil speech, he announces that he wants to take control of the human-animal hybrid technology and use it to overthrow the government so that they can wipe out all the white people. And this is dumb. The tech hasn't even been tested yet. Like, he doesn't even know if it works. It Wouldn't it make sense to wait until after the scientists are done putting it together before you attack and reveal yourself? Because, like, what if you attack now and take all their data and then find out, like, oh, okay, it doesn't actually work. Like, we're... What are you going to do then? You don't have any scientists of your own that we know of. And they, I mean, he just tells all this to Eden as well, because I guess we need a villain and the villain needs an evil speech or something. I don't know. And anyways, while they're uh, marching her away at gunpoint, uh, Eden activates the lab's self-destruct sequence with a passcode. Because, yeah, a self-destruct passcode is the sort of thing you give to a low-level lab technician. Like, e even though she got it from her father, who's the head scientist, it doesn't make any sense for him to give it to her. It's just... I, I hate to keep repeating myself, but just saying it's just weird or it's just dumb is sometimes the best thing for a lot of the stuff that happens in this fucking book. So, the fighting breaks out between uh, Bramford and some security guards and the FFP, and Bramford transforms into a half-panther man. So he gets bigger and he has claws and fangs and stuff, and he's strong enough that he can fight off the FFP, even though they have guns, and he realizes, okay, this lab's about to self-destruct, so they all hop in his hovercraft and fly off before it blows up. And in the hovercraft at this stage, we have Bramford, Eden, her father, Austin, who is her dog, remember, and a flight attendant named Daisy, who is also a white person. And the Latino pilot from earlier is just gone. He, he just isn't there anymore, and he's never mentioned again. I guess. And then they get chased by the government for a bit, and it's a very tense and thrilling action scene, let me tell you. Like, it's so dangerous that Eden has time to get horny in the middle of it. 
Eden found her body tilting towards his. Maybe it was illogical for a pearl to be drawn to such a dangerous creature, but she wanted to touch him. Eden is a furry confirmed, I guess. Now, like I said, this is the opening act of the story done. Like, from this point forward, things are much different, and uh, it's not doesn't take place in the tunnels. And after this, like I said, there is much less racism. It's there, and we'll talk about it when it comes up, but we are past the worst of it. And let me tell you, it doesn't improve the book at all. Like, I am almost halfway through my notes right now, and that's just the first uh, little over 70 pages of the first book. Like, we still have all of this to go, and then we still have all of this to go. But like I said, the biggest flaw with both of them is just that it's fucking boring. So Eden's father is injured, and they can't treat him. And Eden's immediate first thought is to give up Bramford to the government to save themselves. He saved your life multiple times tonight, you fucking bitch. God, I, I hate Eden so much. Like, like, like I said... The, the part where she just straight up says she hates black people is where I realized, okay, there's no coming back for that, from this. But there's so many other points where she just hammers home what a fucking terrible person she is. Uh, so they tell her that Jamal was dating her so that he could use her for information. And like he could get information about the lab and what sort of experiments are going on. Which might have made sense if he didn't work at the fucking lab. He's a security guard, man. Like he already has access to all this shit. He can talk to people, he can... Uh, and it's not like Eden was a head scientist or anything, she was a fucking lab technician, so it's not like she would know that much more than the other people there. There's so much... There's so many unnecessary parts of this plan. And while they're talking, Bramford realizes, hey, we can't trust this bitch. Uh, she's gonna give us up, she's gonna do something stupid. So he takes her life ban so she can't contact anyone. She freaks out a little bit, but she's unable to overpower him. And they fly off to somewhere called Sector 6. Uh, the government apparently has no control over this area. There are drug lords and stuff. And that's it. That's, that's all we learn. Well, we don't even know where on Earth this area is. We just know it's somewhere. And it also contradicts itself later. And there's also... Sector 6 is just rainforest. Like, it's full of rainforest. Which... I mean, again, this is a rather small scientific inaccuracy, but it bears mentioning. If there was that much solar radiation that it was killing humans, rainforests would be one of the first places to go, not the last. And, I mean, maybe you could mention, like, this area got shielded by the mountains or something, but they, they don't. It's just like, yeah, this one little patch of rainforest is still there, but the government hasn't gone in and taken over and used it for something. So they land somewhere in the jungle, and they walk outside, and they force Eden outside, and she freaks out for a little bit because there's sunlight, and she's like, sunlight will kill you. Obviously, Eden thought, her aunt hadn't experienced this bottomless terror whenever the golden light had stretched its arms towards her. Hey, that's actually kind of a good line. Don't know what it's doing in this book, but, you know, it, it, it actually shows how someone could be so terrified of something that seems so innocuous to us, sunlight. You know, it's like actually a good line. That's weird. I also want to mention that just the part from them getting on the hovercraft to them landing and all the conversation I mentioned before where there wasn't really that much, that's almost 30 pages. Just throwing that out there. So right away they run into an Indian tribe called the Huaurani. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the Huaurani are a real tribe, actually. They live in Ecuador. And they're super primitive, they still live in, like, thatched roof huts, and they don't have any modern weaponry or technology or anything, but somehow they survived out here without being in the tunnels. And, like I said earlier, I, how would they fit into this racial caste system? Because they were never mentioned earlier, and the government must know about them, like, there must be at least some Indians who went into the tunnels at some point, like, where would they where would they fit? I just... I don't know. You could have said something with that. And I may as well say this now. There are Aztecs nearby. Like, Aztecs live very close to the Huaurani, like, within walking distance. Here's the thing. Like I said, the Huaurani are from Ecuador. The Aztecs were from Mexico, which is on a different continent. 
Indigenous tribes are not all the same, Victoria. They're very different. They're very distinct from one another. The Hualrani also seem to worship Bramford because he looks like an Aztec jaguar god, even though, again, they're not Aztecs, so they shouldn't be worshipping the Aztec pantheon. In spite of her disgust, Eden's eyes riveted on his broad, dark chest that gleamed in the sunlight. Even the molecules of air seemed to fall away from his powerful physique. Maybe he did deserve to be worshipped, she admitted. I don't know what to add to that, but I will say that worshipped is spelled wrong. So Daisy hands them some supplies and flies off with the hovercraft. Like, just flies off, she's gone, and they're all just in the jungle now. But she also puts Eden's life band in her pack, uh, secretly, without telling anybody. And I'm gonna be straight up, most of the rest of the book revolves around Eden trying to get her life band back. So Bramford already knows the Hualrani. I guess he came up here and spoke with them before and has lived amongst them a little bit. Again, he's 22. He shouldn't have all this life experience. Uh, and they just start to hike off into the jungle uh, to the Hualrani's home village. And Eden worries about getting cancer from the sunlight. And I'm like, it doesn't happen that fast. You know, if the radiation was really that bad that it would give you cancer right away, it would kill you pretty quick. But it, it, if it's just the cancer you need to worry about, then that would take weeks to develop at least but okay sure whatever we're just moving past that Eden has a phobia of the sunlight so they reach the Hualrani village and they, it's mentioned that Eden is afraid of the water because it'll wash off her blackface yeah a lot of you probably forgot she's been wearing blackface this whole fucking time even though I mentioned it before she's been wearing it this whole time and she tries to use her mind powers to manifest the life band into her backpack Etc. You know, that sort of thing. I'm not explaining that. I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, so, later, when she gets by herself, she manages to pull the band out of the backpack, and before she can use it to contact anyone, a monkey steals it, runs off into the jungle. Then she tries to run off after the monkey and get it back, and she falls into a river. And this washes off her blackface, so the rest of the story, she's not wearing it. Uh, Bramford saves her life, and now she's white again, so I guess everything is terrible again. And at this point, the story basically vanishes. You know, I, I guess it really vanishes as soon as they land in the jungle, but like, there's just, there's nothing happening. Like, Eden tries to get the life band back, she gets super horny over Bramford because she's a furry, and that's pretty much it for a very long time. Eden also never experiences any sort of withdrawals despite going cold turkey on oxycodone, those of you who have gone cold turkey on opioids before, please tell the others how difficult and unpleasant that would be. Please tell them. Like, it's mentioned briefly, like, Bramford hands her some berries and says, here, eat these, it'll ward off the effects of your detox or something. But I don't think berries work that way. Eden also just goes back and forth and back and forth between hating Bramford and loving him. Like, literally from one paragraph to the next, her mind will change. She'll think about... Bramford is an awful person. I hate him so much. I cannot wait to get away from here and have him arrested. To, God, he's so horny, or he's so hot and so sweet, and God, I just want him. Like, I'm tired. Bramford sunk his weight into a crouch and directed his rage at her. Eden's knees wobbled. The name had struck a nerve in him. If she said it again, he might make her pay. He might grab her with those big, rough hands and pin her down. Just imagine that for over a hundred pages. So in the midst of all this, they mention somebody named Rebecca multiple times, and each time they mention her, Bramford just gets mad and changes the subject, and especially with Eden, he tells her, don't talk about Rebecca, blah blah blah. And eventually, much later, we learn that she was his ex-wife, who was white and actually looked a lot like Eden. She also had blonde hair, blue eyes, and she was killed by the FFP. Like, there. I just... I just saved you several hours of reading, right there. And we also learn, at this time, that there's a plant that the natives eat which prevents them from dying from radiation. Like, the plant has miraculous healing properties and it, they just chew it and it prevents them from getting cancer. Like, sure, we'll, we'll just go with that. We'll just accept that. We'll just accept it, sure. Uh, we also learn that Bramford's transformation was apparently not complete and for Eden's father to complete it, uh, he needs some more DNA from the various animals that were uh, implanted in him. Because he wasn't just mixed with panthers, he was mixed with 
you know, jaguars, pythons, and a couple other things. So they need samples of their DNA in order to complete this. And I, I just, a lot of this weaves in and out in a weird order. I'm just doing it one at a time to help avoid confusion. So Eden gets attacked by a python, and Bramford actually saves her life. Not sure why, but he saves her life. And finally, from this point forward, she does stop hating him. What else did she need in life besides the warmth of his body next to hers? She was done with regrets. From now on, she would follow her heart. In fact, she would forgive the past and start fresh with Ronson Bramford. Eden licked tiny beads of water that clung to the hairs on his chest with the tip of her tongue. His full-throated rumbling sounded full of yearning. You know, all this sexual stuff between Eden and Bramford has caused me to think about something, and that's that cats have barbed penises. So does Bramford have a barbed penis? I had to wonder, and now so do you. So during the fight with the python, they both get wounded, so they just have to chill out for a few days while they heal and they can't trek back to the village, even though they're right near the village. It seems like it would be better to be over there while you're healing, but whatever. So Bramford decides to go on like a spirit journey because spirit journeys are a thing now and like shamans are, are a thing now. And he just ingests some sort of hallucinogenic plant and goes on this journey while Eden is there watching him. And this lasts about five chapters. That is not an exaggeration. Five shitting McDickcock chapters. He's just sitting there hallucinating and Eden's just watching and that's it. And I don't know, later he tells the story of a shaman, which... Just, just, just listen. Only the shaman drank the Bejeco de Oro in the special ceremonies long ago. It allowed him to see far ahead so he could protect the people. They called him El Tigre because his spirit flew with the speed of a jaguar. That line does not make me wish I was dead. That line makes me wish I was never alive to begin with. We called him the tiger because he moved like a jaguar. Like, what? J if he moves like a jaguar, just call him El Jaguar. That's the Spanish name for jaguar. Now, I, I learned that apparently in Latin America, or at least parts of it, people do often refer to all big cats as jaguars. So lions, tigers, ocelots, like they're just all jaguars, which, okay, fine. It's not as stupid as it sounds at first, but if you're going to do that, at least throw in a line about it. Like, ha throw in a single line where Eden's like, wait, why would they call him that if he was a jaguar? Oh, they just call all big cats jaguars, you know, that's just their thing. Like, you could do that. It wouldn't be that difficult. And that right there is just a microcosm of everything wrong with this book. Like, there's just no effort put in at any stage and no thinking put in at any stage. So while he's hallucinating, he's talking about to Eden how, like, she loves him, her or he loves her, and blah blah blah, and then he calls her Rebecca at some point, and then she realizes, oh, he's not actually talking to me, he thinks he's talking to his ex-wife. Go ahead, Eden thought. Rip my body apart. My heart is already in pieces. Can you please just die of AIDS? <laughs> just, does anybody have AIDS who they could put their dick in her face and get her started on that? So later, Bramford goes on a rant about how people wrecked the environment, and that's the way why the world is the way it is, and it's never specified how radiation got so bad. Like, losing the ozone layer would be bad, but it wouldn't do this. It wouldn't get this awful. Like, if it was just a plot device, if it was just like, yeah, the world is covered in solar radiation now, like, I, okay, fine, I can work with that. I can just uh, not think about it too hard and, excuse me, go through with it. And I could bring it up as a, as a flaw, but it wouldn't bother me that much. But now that you're bringing it up, I have to think about it and think, like, how could humans possibly have done this? Is this about racism or is it about the environment? I just, I, I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be about both. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, like I said, there was no thinking put in. So Eden decides that she wants to be an animal hybrid as well. She wants to transform into a furry the same way that Bramford did. And she, said, she refers to it as wanting to become a she-cat, which is just a stupid name. Like, I don't have anything else to add. It's just a stupid name. God, you, you have no idea how much time I am skipping. Like, all of this is so fucking stretched out. It is absolutely ridiculous. So, 
While all this is going on, she also learns that Logan, that Bramford has a son who is named Logan, like him and Rebecca had a son. And Logan stays in a shack 24 seven and he never comes out. Like not during the daytime, not at nighttime, just never, he stays there all the time. And Eden tries to coax him out. And at this stage, there is a stretch of about seven pages where I made no notes at all, which tells me that this part of the book is almost tolerable. Now, eventually she lures Logan out and she sees that he is a cotton, which is, you know, an albino person. And it turns out Bramford and Rebecca both carried the gene and Bramford is super ashamed of it. And that's why he has a son hidden up here. So no one will kill him. And he also wants to transform Logan into a cat man as well so that he can survive and actually go outside. And that's like the one moment in this entire book where a character has like believable motivations for all the weird shit they do. How could Bramford have produced such a child? The albinism gene had been all but wiped out, at least according to the Unigov's proclamation. True, they found the occasional albino and murdered the poor thing. Eden shuddered at the ghastly fate Logan had escaped. The albinos are all extinct, except for the ones that are still alive. Like, do, do, do you hear yourself think? We still have 50 pages of this shit left. I hope you're aware of that. So Eden's dad is still really sick and wounded, and I'm, I'm so concerned about him, etc. And so Eden and Bramford go off into the mountains to get more of the magic plant that heals people to heal her dad. And you'd think that there would just be plants nearby because this is where the Huarani live and they actually eat it regularly. So you'd think they would grow it or it would just grow wildly nearby. But I guess they have to go on a long trek. And here's the thing. I think that if this had been the plot, it might have been fine. You know, it's, it's an adventure with a clear goal. Like, they have to hike through the jungles and the mountains, through all kinds of danger, in order to get this miraculous plant and bring it back to save her dad's life. Like, it's an adventure with a clear goal. There are characters who, I mean, even if you wanted to stick with the racism aspect, like, one of them could be black and one could be white, and they could dislike each other at first, but have to work together, and then they could bond over the course of the story. And you could even skip over all that... FFP stuff at the beginning and all the terrorism stuff and the stuff about the evil governments like this This might have been a perfectly fine story But I don't know why I'm trying to make this better. It is just not worth the effort, but I don't know It doesn't really work here because it only lasts like two chapters. So it just doesn't have time to sink in You know none of the events that happen have any time to <laughs> Have any emotional impact. It's also weird. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's weird that the government never took over this area or explored it, like, you know, they never looked around to see if there was anything useful in this area, because they're like, well, they, everything here survived the radiation, you know, the plants and animals, so maybe we should look into that, but I guess they'd just rather hang out underground. So, they find the plant, and then there's some Aztecs nearby who they just say hello to, and that's it, they don't get into a fight or anything, they just sort of say hello. And uh, there are some Aztec ruins nearby, which is weird that they're ruins because the Aztecs still live there, but whatever. And allegedly those ruins are thousands of years old. The thing is, the Aztec Empire didn't exist until 1428. Which makes me wonder, how far in the future is this? Like, if this is 200 years from today, then the Aztec ruins would be only about 800 years old. So it's not thousands, but if it's many thousands of years in the future, I have to wonder, like, okay, how is their technology not better? And, like, just, I don't know anything about this world other than stupid shit. Like, I don't know how old it is. You're, you're opening yourself up to so many questions and so much fucking criticism. So they get back to the village. Uh, they give Eden's father the plant. Uh, she decides she cannot live without Bramford. Okay, sure. Uh, so she finally, she finally gets her life band back. And she just sends a message to Shen. I didn't actually write why she sent a message or what she said, but she sent it. Now, the thing is, she was warned not to send out any messages at all because they could be traced back to her, but she just straight up tells Shen where they are. Like, she tells him, yep, we're, we're here. Like, come on and get us. And Bramford finds out about this and he's pissed, so he locks her in a prison cell because he's afraid his animal instincts will take over. I, I guess they have animal instincts, I just, I don't know, that that part of the story is not really explored or explained, so I just, I haven't been talking about it. 
and he has to run off into the jungle to make sure he doesn't hurt anybody and he doesn't want her to follow him. Okay, sure. And so the next day, after this happens, Jamal and the FFP arrive to take the village hostage because Eden told them exactly where they were. And more than that, the two men who kidnapped and sexually assaulted Eden earlier take her out of the cell and into the middle of the village where they have everybody gathered up and they have them at gunpoint. Yum, Pearly, Giant said, grabbing her. Yeah, I'm not talking about that one. I just, I just wanted to let you all know that it exists. And it is kind of weird to me because there's only one guy with a gun that's holding the entire village hostage. And I have to wonder, why don't the Hwaorani have any guns? Or any modern technology? Like, sure, you could say most of it was lost or destroyed uh, during the apocalypse, but they should have been able to preserve a little bit or scavenge a little bit. Like, it, it's just trying to make them seem more primitive, I guess, which is a whole other can of worms, but I think I've just talked enough about racism for now, so we're not getting into that. And they also mentioned that there's an FFP member there who is half white, and he's also only 13 years old. And Eden takes time to wonder why he was let into the FFP. And I agree with her, that's very strange. That's like meeting a half-black Klansman. And this question is never answered. It's never even really brought up again. It's just not, not even close. They just sort of mention it once and then it's gone. Like, th this sort of thing isn't impossible. Like, you know, in real life there was a guy named Jackie Arklov who was a half-black neo-Nazi. Like, trust me, I don't have time to get into that, but you can look it up yourself. It's weird. Uh, but, yeah, that, that's it. Like, it's not impossible that a half-black dude would, or a half-white dude would join up with this organization, but it is very strange, and you should spend some time on that, maybe. Maybe just a little, I don't know. So some Aztecs pop out of the jungle and shoot darts into the soldiers, and it kills several of them. And then Jamal panics and starts taking hostages, and then all hell breaks loose, and he shoots the dog. Jamal struggled to lift the dog off of him. Just then, Logan made a heartbreaking sound. No, son! Bramford called. The boy brought Squeaky's machete down onto Jamal's chest with a sickening thump. The wounded leader fell back, his death rattle filling the stunned silence. First, I want to accuse Victoria Foyt of using the shoot the dog moment to make him seem more evil, but honestly that makes me like him a bit more because the dog was racist. And also there's a typo. Like I said, there, there's typos in here. And some of you might be wondering, like, wait, this is published by an actual publisher. It's not self-published, it was published by Sand Dollar Press. So why are there spelling errors? Shouldn't they have an editor on hand? And, well, I looked into that a little. It turns out Sand Dollar Press is actually owned by Victoria Foyt. So, like, she created her own company to publish her books, which... I mean, that's technically not self-publishing, but it's pretty fucking close. It's also apparently a corporation, which is weird because you'd think it would be an LLC, but that's a tangent. So, yeah, the, during this whole climax with all this hostage taking and this fighting, Eden does nothing. <clears throat> like, she stands there and yells and worries about people, but she doesn't actually do anything to help or contribute, despite being the protagonist. And this whole climax is less than 20 pages. So, yeah, we have all this build up. And I, I mean, like, the whole climax from the moment that the, the FFP arrives in the village to them all being killed. Like, we don't have any time for any of this to sink in. And then later, after the dust has cleared, it also felt good to be of use to the Hwarani who had given her so much. Now that their location had been discovered, they needed to relocate. Guess what? Hmm? You're a bitch! Fuck you, bitch. This is your fault. You're the one that told them where they were. Or told the FFP where they were. Like, th you're the reason they have to pack up and leave the, their homes that they lived in, presumably for their whole lives. Like, that's the thing about Eden. On page two, she gives all the reason in the world to hate her. She has nowhere to go but up, but she insists on digging deeper at every turn. Just... Uh, so anyways, the book ends right after that. Eden is planning on turning into a cat person, and she loves Bramford. And... Boy, was that terrible just in every goddamn way it was terrible like a world in which there's horrible racism but it is against and put some dramatic music here white people ooh that's the worst dystopia they can think of like 
everyone is mean to white people except for a few people, and then you die if you go outside, <clears throat> and that's pretty much it. Which is just not how racism works. Like, there's a lot more stuff to it than that, and it's a lot more uh, unpleasant than that. Like, here's a list of things that various racial groups have had to deal with at some point or another all over the world that are never brought up here. Uh, being unable to vote slash participate in government. Slavery. Having toxic waste dumped near their homes. Being more likely to be harassed slash brutalized by police. Being followed around the store by security. Having cops called on you while minding your own business. Suffering harsher, pe harsher penalties from the justice system when convicted of a crime. Not being allowed to live in certain neighborhoods being unable to marry someone of another race, and forced relocation. That's not a complete list, that's just some stuff that, if you could have brought up any of them, it would have made this book a bit better, or at the very least it would have made it more grounded in reality. Like, Victoria Foyt did zero research, and just kind of assumed she already knew everything that she needed to know, and then she wrote in furry sex. Like, I don't know, there's, just, there's another series with a similar concept, which I read a little bit of, called uh, Knots and Crosses. And, like I said, I only read a little, but it is so much better at a similar concept. Like, it's a world where, uh, in history, Africa colonized Europe, and took that over, and then it was decolonized, and then, so you have a bunch of, the, well, the social order is basically flipped, you know? Black people are largely wealthier and in charge compared to white people. And so racism against white people is prevalent. And it's better for... <laughs> let's be honest, it's partially better just because it was written by a black person who knows a bit more about what they're talking about. And it only changes the social fabric of the world. That's the important part. Like, it changes society, but humans themselves and the environment are the same. Save the Pearls changes the world to make racial differences seem as if they're scientific and biologically ingrained in a way which they're not. Like I said earlier, if radiation is that bad, being black is not going to make much of a difference, but apparently it does here. And despite how much this system sucks, the system of segregation, how much it sucks, Eden just kind of ignores it after a while. Like, that's the thing that makes this book fail more than anything else. Like, it's supposedly about how awful this system is and how awful racism and discrimination are, but the characters never really do anything to fight against it, really. Like, they're, they're fighting against the FFP, but the FFP aren't the government. I don't think, at least. It's, again, it's stupid and not made clear. Like, Eden just wants to leave and turn into a she-cat. Like, that, that's her goal by the end. And even before that, she just wants to find a black boyfriend. She doesn't want to fix anything. And here's another detail, which I probably wouldn't have noticed in any other book. Like, I probably wouldn't have noticed it, and if I did notice it, I probably wouldn't bring it up here because I figured it would have been coincidence. But, did you notice how, in this book, the p black people who are nice have names like Ronson and Peaches, but the black people who are evil and mean to Eden have names like Ashina and Jamal? Jesus Christ. Now, like I said, Foyt defended herself in not a, not a very good way, but one of the things she said to defend herself was that uh, she claimed a black person read her book and talked to her at a convention and told her that she liked it. I guess it's nice to have confirmation that Candace Owens can read, but I don't think she speaks for the entire black community. If Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. This whole thing just feels like it was written a hundred years ago by someone who wanted to help but was still delusional and had some very interesting ideas about race and how it works. And, uh, I don't know, that's about all I have to say about the first book, so, uh, let's continue to engage in literary self-harm by going to Save the Pearls Part 2, Adapting Eden. Now, on the cover, this one says it's the sequel to the award-winning novel, S Revealing Eden. And I didn't believe that at first, but I looked into it, and apparently it's true. Yeah, the, the first book won the Eric Hoffer Best Young Adult Book Award. And the Eric Hoffer Award seems to be, like, a, a legit award. You know, it's not something that just... It, it, like, it's an actual award. It's not something she just made up. And I don't know what they were thinking at all. 
And then the back of the book has some positive reviews of the first one, including from, like, the San Francisco Book Review, the Midwest Book Review, the Huffington Post, and, like, I, I do not know why these reviewers gave this book any praise at all. Like, its flaws are pretty obvious. It's not like uh, a lot of these issues are just, like, specific little grievances that bother me personally. Like, there's some pretty serious problems here just looking at, like, plot and character and all that. Uh, but the weirdest one of this is that one of the positive quotes comes from Marion Williamson. Y'all remember Marion Williamson? Like, she's probably most famous because she tried to run for president in 2020, and she started talking about how her opponents were har harnessing dark psychic energy, and she was talking about orbs and shit. Like, she was weird. And I feel the need to bring up that she apparently liked the first book in this series. And then this book is basically just a continuation of Eden's... Well, I was gonna say journey, but I don't think that's the right word. From atop an Aztec pyramid, the last of its kind among the ruins of Earth, Huitzilopochtli looked out over a hidden pocket where a small tribe of Aztec people lived. Long ago, they had escaped the vengeful arm of the Spanish conquistadors and taken refuge here. If not for the discovery of a miraculous he healing plant, they would have died. So, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but basically, Aztec gods are confirmed as real in this world. And also, apparently, Victoria Foyt learned that, oh, Ecuador and Mexico are different places, so, like, I guess the Aztecs just fled, some of them fled from the conquistadors and hid out in the jungle for hundreds of years afterwards. But, like, it's on a different continent. It's not like it's just a hop, skip away, but... Okay, sure, but, like, let's focus on the Aztec gods being real. That raises literally dozens of questions about this world and how it works and the nature of this planet, and I'm just, I'm going to ignore all of those questions because I already know none of this was thought through. It's also a little bit weird that these are, like, the only Aztecs left because they still kind of exist in real life. Like, you know, their entire culture and everything with and their religion with human sacrifice, that doesn't exist anymore, but... Like, they still have descendants, and a lot of those descendants still speak Nahuatl, which was the language of the Aztec. Or, rather, it was the language of the Mexica tribe, who were in charge of the Aztec Empire, but it's a, let's not even get into all that. Like, they didn't call themselves Aztecs. And so basically, uh, in this prologue, Huitzilopochtli talks about how Eden is their only hope. It's, it's nice to have characters just come out and reassure the audience that the protagonist is the coolest, bestest, most special person of all time. That's important to know. So Eden and Bramford are just hanging out in the jungle. Just, just kind of hanging out. Not really doing anything else. Not, just, just hanging out in the jungle. And Victoria Foyt spends a couple of sentences repeating her argument from her blog that I mentioned earlier, that coal is not a slur because coal can, coal can be burned for fuel. It wasn't great then, it's not great now. They also mention that Eden's genetics are inferior, but Bramford loves her anyways. And I, I mean, I already kind of brought this up, but like, this series implies, or in this case just outright states, that some races are better than others. Like, it defeats its own argument at every turn. And even then, like, this world has genetic engineering, right? Like, I imagine it would be much easier to just alter humans than it would be to change them into human-animal hybrids. So, why not just get rid of the bad genes? You know, why not just make it so that there aren't any white people or Asian people or Latino people or anything? Like, they're, they're just all black. Like, Jesus, this book is so bad, it's making me advocate for eugenics because that's somehow better than what it is they're doing here. I don't know, this whole section of the book is really just Bramford and Eden swooning over each other. Bramford swept his hand over her face, pushing back her long golden hair. His emerald eyes pulled her to him like magnetic beams. I'm starting to doubt that Victoria Foyt has ever read a book before. So they run off into the jungle, and they run into some Aztec warriors who are wearing jaguar pelts. And Eden spends an entire paragraph thinking that they're jaguars standing on their hind legs. It, I guess it's not the craziest thing to believe in this world, but it's still stupid. Like, you could have just spent a sentence saying she for a moment she thought they were jaguars standing on their hind legs then she realized they were people like, you know it makes her seem dumb when 
you don't do that. So the Aztecs also all talk in Spanish too, which is a little weird. You'd think they would speak Nahuatl. And later it's mentioned that they do speak Nahuatl, so why are they speaking Spanish in this case? I don't know. Uh, it's also mentioned that Eden apparently understands Spanish because she used to listen to it on her life band a lot, which, again, not the craziest thing. Like, it's future technology, you just hear the translations a lot. Like, okay, she has some exposure to the language, I'll accept that, but it's something you should have brought up earlier. They talk about how the Hualrani need to pack up and leave before the FFP come back. We already knew that, you don't need to repeat it, but okay. And so while everyone is packing up, we are introduced to Kevin, or we're properly introduced to Kevin, uh, who is the half-black FFP member who I mentioned from before. She turned to find Kevin rounding the dirt path that led from the laboratory. Half a head taller than she, and gangly, his Café au Lao skin branded him as mixed breed, half coal, half pearl. Earlier he was 13, now he's 14 despite this being, like, two days later. And also more food for skin tone. It's just, it's just cringe. So, Kevin is just suddenly an important character in this book. Like, apparently he was scared, spared in the battle at the end of book one, which is not mentioned before now. It just, like, Eden sees him that one time, and then he's forgotten about the rest of the book, and then he comes back here. And Eden just sees him as a younger brother for some reason. You know, like... Okay, it's fine to introduce new characters, but if you want us to believe that they have formed some sort of relationship with the old characters who we already know and know, then you have to actually show them bonding a little bit. Like, y you have to show us that. You have to do something, please. But you just, you don't do that here. We, we know nothing about their relationship, but apparently she sees him as a brother. Bramford and Eden's dad both claim that they need to keep the technology a secret, at least for the time being, because if it gets out and the government gets it, it'll inevitably lead to a war, and all the white people will be killed. I, I have several things to say about that. First of all, uh, not everyone would want to transform into a furry. Like, some people would rather stay underground, given the choice. Like, like some people would take it, some people would be fine being animals and being able to run about in the sunlight and stuff, but a lot of people would probably be happier being human underground. And after that, wouldn't the government and FFP have less reasons to kill white people if they were no longer the inferior race? Like, if they're all just human-animal hybrids now, like, wouldn't, wouldn't they just not have inferior races? Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, like, racism isn't based in logic. They would still hold their old hatreds. And you're correct. But this book series tries to claim that racism is based in logic, that it has that whole thing about how white people die easier from radiation. So if their reasons for feeling all this hate are, like, rational and logical, they shouldn't be upset at this. They, sh they should be less upset, at least. And this is the problem with a lot of fantasy and sci-fi series that try to talk about racism by using, like, aliens or different species or something. Like, it always says that racism is bad, yes, but then it gives the bigoted group a real reason to feel the way that they feel. Like, a uh, good example of this uh, from recent years would be the Eldians from Attack on Titan, and I'm not going to spoil the ending, don't worry, but uh, the Eldians can turn into these giant zombie things that like to eat humans, and they can also summon an army of colossal titans which can kill everyone on Earth. Like, they have that capability. So, it kind of makes sense that other people would want to genocide them, because, like, that's removing a threat to their own existence. Like, there's an argument to be made there that genocide is okay. And in real life, that's what all genocides are founded on. You know, the idea that this other group is somehow a threat to you just by existing. Like, the, the idea that this whole ethnic group or whole religion or something is a threat to you just by existing. And Attack on Titan just straight up says, like, yes, this, this actually makes sense. Here is a scenario where that is true. And, I mean, issues with the ending of Attack on Titan aside, that was at least consistent with it, you know? And there was other good stuff to enjoy in that series, and just yada yada. But this is not consistent. This is trying to act like racism is logical and rational, and then it's treating it as though it isn't. Like, which is it? And again, wouldn't it be easier 
to just modify humans so that they're immune to radiation while still staying humans and not being furries. Like, I mean, it's a smaller change, so that makes sense to me. I'm not a geneticist, but it makes sense to me. Like, maybe the characters could give some sort of pseudo-scientific explanation which would explain that. Which, and if they did, that'd be fine, but they don't offer anything. They just kind of ignore it. So they take the magic plants from earlier and they decide to call them Newman's Cure, which is fucking stupid because it, Newman, or uh, Eden and her father's last name is Newman, by the way, just in case you forgot, because all this riveting stuff just... Uh, okay, so they call it New Newman's Cure, even though they didn't fucking discover it, like name it after the natives or something would make more sense, but I suppose that is just par for the course. So anyways, uh, this Newman's Cure plant has made Eden's father healthier, and he's moving around better than he did before. I know I keep calling him Eden's father, but I don't think we ever learn his name. He's just Eden's father, so that's what I gotta call him. And anyways, he's moving around better than he did before, and Eden, for some reason, thinks this is suspicious. Um, we have no reason to believe this is suspicious. We already know this plant is basically magic, but okay. And we also learned that he speaks Nahuatl for some reason, so he can talk to the Aztecs. Like, like he's not a linguist or anything. He just says at some point that he reconstructed the Nahuatl language and now he can speak it. Just, just use a translator or something. You know, you, you have all this sci-fi technology, you can just say, okay, the life band acted as a translator between English and Nahuatl. Like, just, just say that. I would accept that more than this. Uh, so, they talk about how the Aztecs believe that the world ended because there was a lack of spiritual balance. And I don't know if this is really how Aztec theology and cosmology worked, uh, and I don't care enough to check. I feel like Victoria Foyt didn't check either, so it's possible we're both wrong here. But my understanding is that the Aztecs believed they needed to keep the gods fed with human sacrifices, and if they didn't, the world would end. Which... Like, okay, that seems silly to us nowadays, but like, if, if you genuinely believe that the world will end if you don't commit a uh, human sacrifice, then it, it, well, it's hard to blame people for that. But apparently, yeah, these new Aztecs don't believe that. They just believe that the world needs spiritual balance. And their gods are still around, so they obviously didn't starve. And they still sacrifice people in tiny numbers, like I said. So why would changing anything, why would sacrificing more or doing anything change anything? It's not, I, I hate to repeat myself, it's just, it's not explained at all, and I genuinely don't understand this plot point in the slightest. It's just like, yes, we need spiritual balance. How are you going to achieve spiritual balance? Like, we're going to bring in some furries, and... So they go off on their journey to the Aztec home, uh, where hopefully they and the Huarani will be able to live and maybe save the world. And this journey takes a very long time, and they run into no obstacles along the way, which would make it interesting. Like, Eden and Bramford have a ton of hot makeout sessions with each other while they sneak away from others, so that makes me wonder if his tongue is barbed. You know, because cats also have like those sharp little barbs on their tongue, so it sticks to stuff, and now I'm wondering, like, is his? I don't know. It's so strange to me that they have all this potentially neat stuff going on. You know, you have Aztec gods that they're trying to save the world with. Uh, they have racial violence. They have terrorists. They have an evil government. They have an unlivable planet that is dying even more by the day. And they just decide to focus on this weird romance. And even then, that romance sucks. Like, just why are they in love? I can't think of a single reason why they're in love. Eden just decides that she loves him more than she can bear at some point. I just, I don't understand. She distrusts him, and then she thinks he hates her for being white. Then she thinks that he hates, he brought her out to the jungle, and then at some indeterminate part, she... I have a headache. There's not even any effort put in here. Like, just... Okay, uh, so her and Bramford just decide they're gonna get married, which... As apparently rare in this world, like, people usually just mate the once and then part ways, which is a little odd, but okay, whatever, I'll, I'll work with it. So they finally reach the Aztec home, and they go to the pyramid, and they meet Huitzilopochtli, and then they just kind of take for granted that he's a god. 
Like they, they say, hey, this is which who H. I'm gonna call him H. This is H. He's a god, and then they just kind of go like, wow, he seems like a god. I guess he's a god, and like, yeah, you don't need any proof to find out about this sort of thing. But okay, sure, we'll just move past that. And um, it turns out that H believes that Bramford is a jaguar god, and that him being here will help them bring spiritual balance to the world. Again, I don't understand how or why, but it's, it's a thing that they believe. They also believe that Eden needs to transition to a cat person so that the balance can be complete. And you know what? You were not expecting this. Okay, I, when we started on this journey together and I told you that this was just racist Hunger Games, you were not expecting human-animal hybrids and Aztec gods to enter into the equation. You just... Th this has gone so off the goddamn rails. So two women show up at the pyramid, and we later learn that, that their names are Mezli and Yolotli. From their proud bearing, Eden guessed that they belonged to the noble class, probably mother and daughter. The girl must have been about 14 or 15. Her pert breasts jutted against her sleeveless saffron-colored blouse, which set off her warm brown skin. Why are you talking about a 14-year-old girl's breasts? Why? So Eden goes with them, and she's supposed to stay with them until the wedding happens. I'm not sure why she's supposed to stay with them until the wedding happens, but okay, she just goes with it. And through several pages of painful attempts at communication, which, like, they could have brought a translator, like either a person or an electronic one, but okay. Uh, through several pages of attempts at communication, they tell her that she is, or she's supposed to become, Shochipili, who is the goddess of love. Eden smiled. How lucky to be with people who worshipped love. That was so cringe I just made a black hole in my fucking face. So Eden stays with them for several weeks, and during this time I guess she becomes friends with Yolotli. I mean, it, we don't see much of it happening, but uh, they're, they're great friends, let me tell you. And I mean, what little we do see is awful. Yolo pointed to the quarter moon, soft and pale, in a corner of the sky like a parenthesis to the day. Mezli, she said. Eden got it. Your mother's name means moon. Mine was called Lily. It used to be a common flower. Her chest tightened as she added, She's dead now. Lily, Yolo repeated with deep sadness. Eden glanced at her new friend. She understood, didn't she? Somehow Eden had communicated the very essence of her mother and her longing for her too when she said her name, and Yolo had understood. She got the essence of Eden's mother just from hearing her name. It's amazing the sort of things you can learn when the author just decides to instantly implant information into your brain. Later, they go back to the pyramid and they talk with Bramford for a bit. And Bramford tells Eden that she shouldn't get attached to the Aztecs because they're not our people. Like, fucking hell, I guess racism is okay sometimes. Just <sighs> So anyways, the priests kill Yolotli by cutting her heart out. Yeah, it turns out she's just a human sacrifice, because again, they're, they're Aztecs, that's what they do. And Eden is upset about this, even though Yolotli went willingly, and she just openly, in front of everybody, swears that she's going to kill the priests. Great way to endear yourself to these people. This might have hit harder if, one, we knew Yolo as a person, like, we don't know anything about her, why should we care about her, and if, two, we knew this wouldn't help. Because again, this co the cosmology here is not very well explained, and it's possible that killing her actually does feed the gods and help, and it will help uh, bring the world back to life. So in that case, it's more of a noble sacrifice, but it's also possible that it, it does nothing, and we're not sure which one it is. So if, it, if we knew it wouldn't help, it would be kind of heartbreaking. But anyways, Eden knows she's going to adapt soon, and she just bides her time and decides, okay, once I turn into a cat person, I'm gonna kill these people. And uh, she... There's a scene where she takes a hallucinogen, the same one that uh, sent Bramford on a spirit journey, and she re relives that scene of the white kids playing on a beach. And this whole book is told in third person past tense, but then this one little scene is told in first person present tense from Eden's point of view. I don't know why, but that's what happens. Eden learns that her dad is experimenting with uh, Newman's cure. Like, rather than just chewing on it, he is actually injecting it into his veins, directly into his blood, and that's why he seems so much healthier. And this is bad, because... 
I, I don't know why it's bad, but Eden thinks it's bad. Uh, so she takes all of his plants that he's using for his experiments and throws them into a fire. Stupid cunt, it's not like those are valuable or anything. <laughs> and she takes some time to think about how awful it is that her father might be becoming a junkie, even though a couple of weeks ago she was addicted to oxycontin, or oxycodone, technically a different thing. It, losing access to oxy was her biggest fear. And like she has no room to judge anybody, or maybe she could at least think about how I was that way and I don't want other, anyone else to be that way, but she, she doesn't. I guess she's just a hypocrite. I don't know, man. And finally, over 120 pages into the second book, Eden gets changed into a cat person. I'm not sure how exactly, because her father needed a bunch of advanced technology to change Bramford, and like both the Aztecs and the Hualrani don't have any modern technology. And they, they mention that he's putting some stuff together earlier, but like again, these people don't even have guns. I don't know where they get such advanced computers and machinery that they'd be able to do this genetic modification. So now Eden is also a furry. You know, she looks like Bramford. She's tall, muscular, has claws, sharp teeth. And she, the only thing different is that her fur is white, and she is annoyed by the fact that her fur is white. Okay, uh, that's, that's a thing. But she still thinks about how beautiful she is because, you know, she's a furry, and furries are beautiful. And her animal instincts, which, remember, are a thing, apparently, uh, take over for a bit, and she runs off to kill the priests that sacrificed Yolotli. And as soon as she gets there, she just decides she doesn't want to kill them, even though that was, like, her whole mission in life for a couple of weeks, but... Okay, uh, they tell her she has to subdue Bramford, because Bramford represents war, and she represents love. Again, this isn't very well explained. Like, uh, it says you need balance, but, like, if they're both gone, then that's balanced. And if they're both there, and they cancel each other out, like, there's no difference between that and them being gone. So, I, again, I don't know what's going on here. So, she takes Yolo's head and buries it in the jungle. For some reason, the Aztecs chase after her. Uh, they're chase, they chase her for, like, a page. There's not really any action or anything, and then it's, it, it's just done. And then Bramford catches up with her, and they fight for a minute because that's romantic, I guess. It, is that romantic? I don't know. I, leave a comment down below if you and your significant other have ever had a fight to the death. Finally, we hear about Bramford's tragic backstory. So we learn his dad was black, and he was maybe in the FFP, but it's not totally clear. Either way, the FFP killed him. And at some point, he cheated on Bramford's mom with an Asian woman, uh, who was Shen's mother, and that's where Shen came from. And there was a line about how his mom pretended that she got raped in the tunnels, because that's just very common, and it was easier to explain than explaining an affair. I'm not even touching that one, we're just, we're just moving past it, like, there's too much rape here as is. Any rape here is too much, but, you know, there's too much already. And Aztecs chase them some more, again, I, I don't know why. Like, later they meet back up and they're all just, they're all just friends again, for some reason. They're not angry. And at some point during all this, Eden cuts her hand and it heals over, like, real quick. She's like, whoa, what the hell, that, that was, that was so fast, how did my hand heal so quick? And she also learns that her other organs are just constantly regenerating, so she might actually be immortal. And it turns out that uh, Eden's father actually put the Newman's Cure plant into her serum when she got transformed into a furry. And so her transformation was a bit different than Bramford's, and she's more powerful than him. And... Eden, upon learning this, is upset, and justifiably so, I would say, because her father is performing medical experiments on her without her consent. Like, I understand being upset about that, but she also wasn't letting him perform experiments on himself, so it's not like she really has the high ground when it comes to bodily autonomy here. You know, it's not like she's saying, hey, you can do that to yourself, but just don't do it to me, because I, I have control over my own body, but... I also have control over yours, like, you know, she has... It seems a tad hypocritical, but again, whatever. And the whole thing here is that this is still an experimental procedure. Like, turning her into a furry at all is experimental. Because they've only done it once before, they're still working the kinks out. Like, they're gonna have to change some stuff, Eden. This process is not understood, 
and there are risks, and they're just trying to figure out how it works. Like, that's, that's how experimentation works. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my camera. Hopefully I don't run out of batteries before this thing is done. So finally, Eden and Bramford get married, and then they go to bed together, and I am skipping the next couple of pages. I, I hope you don't mind. Like, you know, I, I can deal with a lot of shit. I am not reading about furry sex. I'm just, I'm not doing it. And this is all that happens until about page 200. Like, everything I've gone over, that, that's 200 pages of this shit. And finally, around 200 pages in, Eden and Bramford are in a, hanging out in a cave together, and a group of white soldiers hike, hiking through the jungle finds them. And Bramford takes their life bands so they don't call out for help or anything, and they all talk for a bit. This comes completely out of nowhere, but at least there's a plot now, so... Okay, we'll deal with that. So, it turns out all these white soldiers are from a group called the League of Maquis, which is a group of white terrorists fighting against the government. They've never been mentioned before this. I mean, like I said, there was one brief mention of a bombing by a pearl terror- of white terrorists. I, I'm sorry, it's so cringe to call them pearls, I'm just- I'm not doing it. But by a white terrorist, but it doesn't talk about how he's affiliated with any particular groups or ideologies or anything. That might have been a good time to bring up the League of McKee. You know, you could at least mention them once, and even if they don't uh, play a role until later, you would at least be foreshadowing. There's a brief flashback to a time when Eden remembers a bomb going off and her mom telling her that terrorism is bad because the bomb was placed there by the League of McKee, and even if people mistreat them, it's not... Like, terrorism's bad. And then this happens. Had her mother really expected her to sit back and take the Cole's cruelty? In the end, Eden had simply murmured her agreement. Why tax mother's meager energy, even while contemplating a serious option? If her 18th birthday approached with no potential mate in sight, she would join the McKee. What did she have to lose if the Unigov was going to kill her anyway? Hold on. Eden considered being a terrorist? Can I read that book? Because that sounds about 50 times more interesting than what we got here. And I genuinely mean that. Like, a story about how Eden was a terrorist could be really cool. It could be about how she's an oppressed minority and she saw no other path to change, so she decides to start joining up with people who, like, bomb civilians and shit. But then, over time, she realizes, okay, terrorism is bad. Or maybe she could learn about how there are other races that want things to change, too. Like, there are some black people who don't like how things are. There are some white people who are okay with things as they are. There are people of other races who want to change things, but they don't just want to reverse the discrimination so white people are on top and black people are on the bottom. Like, there's so much you could do with that. At the very least, it would be a spin on the whole dystopian young adult thing. Like, you know, uh, where there's just a rebellion that overthrows an evil government. Like, the rebellion's usually just the good guys and... You could do something with having them just be outright terrorists. I don't know, man. It's just frustrating to have that idea dangled in front of my face, because that actually sounds kind of cool. So Shen sent a letter to Bramford, and the League of McKee gives it to him, and he reads it, and it turns out that Shen uh, gave up their location to the FFP in order to save his wife, and then he committed suicide. I'm invested. I'm, I'm just... I'm so invested. Shen didn't even have a line of dialogue, by the way. Literally, throughout both books, he has not a single line of dialogue. The only thing we're getting from his voice is this letter. That's it. We also learn that Rebecca, Bramford's old wife, is still alive, because it turns out she was taken prisoner by the FFP, but they didn't kill her. The McKee rescued her. She's also kind of a bitch. Wrinkling her nose in distaste, Rebecca wagged a finger at Eden. That strange cat girl? Okay, I, I thought She-Cat was a stupid name, but it, it's better than Cat-Girl. Let's, let's not call her Cat-Girl, please. So they go back to the Aztecs, and the Aztecs just decide that Rebecca is the real goddess of love, and she needs to turn into a cat person, and... Alright, I guess we need a villain, sure. And from here, things move pretty fast. Like, this is the last, I don't know, 70 or 80 pages of the book. And so Kevin decides that he's evil, and he joins the McKee, who, again, he's half black, he should have trouble fitting in, you'd think, but they just take him, and there's no problems there. And then he also transforms, and he becomes a cat boy. And then the whole world 
has apparently found out about the animal transformations. Like, yeah, somehow the word got down into the tunnels, and everyone wants to become furries. And there's also escalating violence in the tunnels between the FFP, the League of McKee, and the government. I'm glad we're not seeing any of this, by the way, you know? Like, upheaval, terrorists, action, government, you know? That sounds like it might be kind of interesting. I'm, I'm glad we're just hearing about it secondhand. So the Maquis attack the Aztecs, and Eden hides her father somewhere to make sure they don't get a hold of his technology. And rather than fighting the Maquis, who are the real villains at this stage, is she just... It, while she's in the jungle, she fights a jaguar, and this fight is really difficult on her, and it, she gets a little bit injured, and she almost dies, and it just... Why not have that same thing happen with the actual villains? That's what I'm confused about. The Maquis call for backup, and one of their hovercrafts arrive, arrives, and they take Logan and Bramford away, and Eden tries to save them, but she is unable to do so. However, she does manage to kill the, the leader of the Maquis. He laughed. You don't have Bramford's fortune or resources. Still, it's a pity we would have made a good team. Now he turned the laser gun on Eden. Say goodbye, Newman. Hello, Newman. And then the book ends with Eden and Kevin talking to each other, because Kevin's good again, I guess. He just... he was evil for a little while, and then he was good again, and then he was evil for a little while again with the League of McKee, and now he's good again. And, uh, they just... they vow to go after the bad guys and save the world. And that's... that's it. There, there was a third book that was supposed to come out. It's even advertised at the back of this one as freeing Eden, but it... It just never materialized. It was supposed to come out in 2014. I I assume that Foyt didn't make a lot of money off of these because they didn't sell super well, and she just didn't want more hate from strangers on the internet, which is understandable, to be honest. So she just gave up on it. She, she said, fuck this, no one cares. And it's hard to blame her. I will admit it's a bit frustrating to not get an ending here because part of me just wants to see what would happen. Part of me wants to see just how off the wall they could go here. But... The other part of me wants to paint my headboard with the inside contents of my skull, so... I don't know, I guess I should just be grateful that Freeing Eden never came out. Like, m maybe the day got saved by them just turning everyone into furries. Like, may maybe that was the happy ending that they were planning, I don't know. That was Save the Pearls, and... What the fuck? I mean... What the fuck? It started off in a horrible place, and it somehow got worse. It, it started off so hard trying to be deep and profound, and then it turns into jungle adventures minus the adventure. Like, there's not a single point in this entire series that I could point to and say, yeah, I liked that, or I kind of liked that. There's one good line in the first book, and other than that, there's nothing here that I could point to and say was cool or good, or well thought out at all. Like, I couldn't say that about the setting, or the characters, or the storyline, or anything. That's... that's almost impressive. Like, that, at no point was there a sequence or a character that made me interesting, that, that made me interested. Uh, the plot just keeps stopping. You know, even when semi-decent ideas come up, the plot just stops, and it focuses more on the romance, or just other random adventures. Like, like I said, in the climax, Eden is just fighting a jaguar, which has nothing to do with anything else. The romance is left less than half-assed. Like, I didn't know that was possible, but it's less than half-assed. And I just hate Eden so much. She's the main character, and I despise her so goddamn much. Like, at no point in this series does she ever consider the feelings of other people. She's just whiny and obsessed with getting a black boyfriend. And then later she becomes obsessed with turning into a furry. Like, just... I don't know, imagine a similar story with a black girl trying to get a white boyfriend. Like, the moral, if the author was smart, might be that she doesn't need a man to complete her, or going after someone for racial reasons is stupid and doesn't actually solve anything. Like, just trying to pick out some random white dude that doesn't help matters any. But, just, I don't know, it's so strange to see it in either direction. And Eden never tries to fix this awful society. You know, like I said, she's just a stupid, selfish person who runs away from the world's problems. And 
I don't know, just what what can I add at this point? Like, it's a absolutely, absolutely horribly constructed series. Uh, the only thing I can really do is read a few bad lines for you that I didn't mention before. As he cupped her hips to his, Eden folded around him like the water rounding into the shore. She grabbed hold of his shoulders and arched her back into a parabola of pleasure. A blood-red sky twirled overhead, a private can canopy just for them. Didn't you know, he added, your adopted aunt was a terrorist at heart. She cut against convention her whole life. As I said, the Aztecs believed this spiritual imbalance would bring about a war to end the world. Wait, to end their world or the entire world? Anything is possible. All we can do is wait and see. Despite her dreamy state, Eden caught her meaning. Heart. Your name means heart. No wonder you're so sweet. And so on and so forth. There's, there's a lot of those. You know, like I said, you have free PDFs. Feel free to scroll through yourself. But Victoria Foyt has written other books before. But she writes like an amateur. I, d I don't understand. Like, she has no idea how to structure a plot, write a scene, or research topics she doesn't understand. At least, I assume she doesn't. Maybe her other books are amazing. I don't know. Like, her most recent one came out in 2020. But if I had to guess, and I don't know this for sure, but if I had to guess, I would say she tried to get this published traditionally, and no one would take her manuscript. So she just said, you know what, fine, I'm going to publish it myself. And part of me wants to respect that, because she's just saying, I don't care what the rest of the world is saying. I This is my truth. This is what I want to do. But... She's terrible at it. Like, sometimes you should listen to other people and just stop pursuing your dreams because your dreams are stupid. This is just the absolute worst of self-publishing. You know, like, it's just self-indulgent, and if there was an editor, they sucked at their job. Like, I counted 18 typos in all across both, both books, and, well, that's a lot. It doesn't even feel like she tried, to be honest. Like, I've said similar things before, but like I can forgive a lot of flaws if it feels like you were at least attempting to do something with them if, and if there was some passion behind it, but it doesn't feel like Victoria Foyt did that. It feels like she was chasing a trend because she felt it would be her shot at the big leagues. Like she thought it would be her shot at becoming a more successful author and that the books would sell super well and that she would just become one of the famous dystopian young adult authors that we all still remember who they are today, right? Everyone involved in this should be ashamed of themselves. Like, everyone involved at any stage of this process of bringing these books into the world should be ashamed of what they've brought upon us. And obviously, there's the racism, you know. I went over most of the big issues, but I left out some of the topics that come up over time. Like, how characters consistently refer to the Aztecs as bloodthirsty savages, you know, it's just... That there's other issues that I just, I cannot get into. And I know that Foyt tried to do something good here. I, I know she tried, but God Almighty, you need self-awareness, lady. You, you need some self-awareness. Like, whenever you're going to write about any topic, you need to talk to someone who's familiar about it. Otherwise, you just make an ass of yourself. Like, don't be afraid of asking questions and looking stupid privately when you could look stupid and egotistical very publicly. Because that's what happened here. The, Victoria Foyt just thought she already knew all she needed to know, and th then she looked stupid. She made an ass of herself in front of the entire world. Reading this made me feel like my eyeballs had been circumcised. You know, like, may maybe this could have been something good. Maybe, maybe it could have been something profound, but... You know, it's possible. Like, you would have to rewrite basically everything, but it's possible. You know, it is possible. And I normally try to end these things with, like, a big wrap-up about the specific themes of the book or the book series that I was talking about and what makes this book not just doomed but failed from the start. But in this case, I think it's pretty obvious. You know, I it's pretty obvious why this failed and why it fell apart even after it was never assembled. Like, instead, I want to talk about how this book ties into its genre. This makes absolutely zero sense as any sort of racial allegory or racial commentary. It does make sense as a generic young adult dystopian novel, which is just put into the absolute worst possible setting.
See, many of those YA dystopias, which we're all fond of mocking, and I'm very fond of mocking them too, they were really more of a power fantasy written by well-off Americans. You know, the whole message was basically just, wouldn't it be awful if we were the oppressed ones? But it would also be great because then I would have the chance to be a hero. And, you know, there's just no examination of how dictatorships really functioned or how they came into being, how they eventually fall, or even really what it's like for normal people to live in one. And Save the Pearls brings all those problems into very sharp clarity. Like, in many cases, it was basically just, what if we treated white people the same way we already treat minorities, or that we used to treat minorities? But in this case, it's, what if we treated white people worse than minorities? Kind of. But then we also just pretended that the racism wasn't a thing until it came up, and it was more about environmentalism and then Aztec gods. Like, I, I don't know. It's like, it's just a very interesting lens through which to view that whole genre and how it, how and why it maybe died off so quick. I seriously doubt I'm going to be covering more awful dystopian young adult novels after this. At, at least not in the, this long format, because just, I don't know if there's anything else I can do at this point. Like, the testing was kind of fun, and it was a good example of just how generic and soulless that entire genre could be. But it is not getting worse than this. It is not getting worse than Save the Pearls. Like, I, I have read the worst example of that genre. Everyone else can, you can just give up looking for it, go home. It's, it's done. It's been done. It's the worst. And Victoria Foyt has gotten a lifetime of criticism over this. I don't know if she's done any reflecting, but I hope so, because she's clearly got some weird ideas about how race works and how the world works in general. And that's about all. I Hopefully I never have to talk about this again. Like, The Way of the Shadow Wolves, the Steven Seagal novel I reviewed a while ago, is worse than this. Like, overall. But at least it's funnier. And at least it's shorter, so I could get through it quicker. Like, I just want to pretend that Save the Pearls doesn't exist. Like, the only reason I'm not shredding these books or burning these books is how much I paid for them. Like, I just... I don't know, I, I don't want to talk about Save the Pearls anymore. And now for a quick announcement. I know that I said I would do the fifth sorceress after this, and I'm still going to, but I realize that's a very long series and it's going to take me a while to get through it. Like, normally I try to do these every three months, but the thing is, I already made you wait forever. It's been six months since I put one of these videos out, because, I, like I said, it took me so long to get the second book in this series. So, in between this and The Fifth Sorceress, I'm going to do a much shorter book, one that I can cover a lot quicker. This one is actually a romance novel, which is kind of nice. I haven't really talked about romance, just pure romance as a genre very much, even though there's plenty of material to be mined there. You know, there's plenty of stuff to make fun of. And it's also a book written by a celebrity. Well, he's not a celebrity in the traditional sense, but you've definitely heard of him. And you know me, I love bad celebrity books. Uh, this one was written by an Iraqi fellow who went by the name of Saddam Hussein. So join me next time for Zabiba and the King. That's not a joke, by the way. Saddam Hussein really wrote this. Bye. Who boy, that was, uh, that was a long one. Thank you so much for watching, if you made it this far. Uh, if you see all these names on the screen here, those are the names of my patrons. They give me money over on Patreon, and if you want to get your name here and get access to things like early access to videos, then consider donating. Uh, my $10 and up patrons are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Matthew Baudreau, Microphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Tesla Shark, Bay Victus, and Wesley. Without you guys, I don't know if I'd be able to do this. And if you can't give money on Patreon or you just don't want to, then just subscribe to my channel, uh, like this video, comment on it to help spread it around, or maybe become a YouTube channel member, which is similar, but you don't have to create another account or send me a tip over on PayPal. You know, th th those are all those are all great. Anyways, uh, I'll see you next week. Uh, have a nice 
day, night, whatever time it is. Goodbye.